It's uh, my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Eric Lin, uh, who is the Interim Chips Research and Development Program Director at the Department of Commerce. Uh, until joining the Chips of Our America R&D program, Dr. Lin was the Director of the Material Measurement Laboratory, MML, at, uh, the, at NIST, and he has also served as the Acting Associate Director for laboratory programs at NIST, where he provided direction and operational guidance for all of NIST's scientific and technical laboratories, among other duties. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Lin, who will present his vision and strategy for the National Semiconductor Technology Center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sujay. Thanks, everyone, for being here, and for, thank you for the, the kind invitation uh, to share what it's not just myself, but certainly a whole team at Commerce working on the CHIPS R&D office programs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just last week, we released the vision and strategy paper for the National Semiconductor Technology Center, um, a key component for the CHIPS R&D program. Uh, before I get started into reviewing, to just giving you a quick overview of what the vision and strategy is for the NSTC, as we call it, um, I do just want to call attention to the theme of today's meeting, enhancing the regional impact of the Chips and Science Act. And I hope you'll be able to see that through the different components of the vision and strategy for the NSTC, that we certainly will be, there are certainly many places where regional innovation and regional activities are both critical to the success of the NSTC and the CHIPS program overall, um, but also there are certainly many mechanisms to be able to enhance and drive um, the, the effectiveness and the innovation space within different regions of the country. Okay, so I, this audience certainly doesn't need a review of this, but I think it's worth uh, <laughs> highlighting that the Chips for America Act, two parts, the $39 billion for the incent manufacturing incentives, as I understand, and a lot of discussion about that this morning, and $11 billion for the R&D programs, where we will be building four integrated programs to address the critical needs in terms of filling gaps within prototyping and ensuring that the ideas that are needed for the foundational technologies in semiconductor manufacturing are, are, are born here in the United States, and developed and reach scale here in the US. Okay, and I'll say more about what we're thinking about the overall program while still emphasizing the NSTC. And before I go on, of course, both programs are, are harmonized and focused on developing the workforce that is necessary, not only to fill the jobs that are needed to build the fabs that are, that are going to be constructed over the next few years, but also the workforce and the workforce ecosystem so that the that participants that join this industry can thrive within it and find meaningful careers by staying within semiconductor manufacturing. We're also working closely with our other agency partners to make sure that all the different efforts across the government are connected and with as, li as little friction as possible and often, sell often working with each other so that they can be elevated and supported and working um, harmoni harmoniously. I think that'll be a common theme as you hear as there's a lot of components to this program. There's already so much energy in the country and around the world about both the importance, the critical importance of semiconductor technology, but also the opportunity for what is possible with how many other alter alternative technologies are dependent on, on chips and semiconductors that could be created. And so this theme of how can things be connected, how can things be amplified, how can ideas become reality much faster, are all unifying, and there's no way for a technology as complex as, as semiconductors to do so without a complex set of capabilities, in this case, across the nation. So for the Chips for America Act, the overall goal is to strengthen and advance US leadership in R&D. So again, our, our key goal is to, enhance, is, to, is to secure, provide, meet national security and economic security needs um, through, in this case, on our charge, as US, the US remains a leader in the foundational technologies that are to come. The way we're going to do it in the R&D program is to build an integrated ecosystem that drives this innovation. We have four major programs, the NSTC here at the top, and that will be the, the, the focus of the remainder of the remarks. And we have three other programs, the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program, Manufacturing USA Institutes, up to three, and the Metrology R&D program um, centered on the, on the core NIST mission on measurement science. The, 
all of these programs have a distinct role to play within the semiconductor ecosystem and how to elevate the technology overall. But it's also very clear that there are pieces and components where the successful output from one program is a necessary input for the other and vice versa. So the closer we integrate the ecosystem, the more likely we'll have pathways for any idea to be able to make it into the commercial scale. Now, not only do we need the programs to work together, but we need to be in close partnership with industry, academia, government, and allied and partner nations. The nature of the supply chain, as, we, as I'm sure was talked about this morning for semiconductors, is no less complex in the, if you think about innovation as a supply chain type of activity as well. And so what we need to do is we need to take advantage of the energy and the ideas that are already existing and help the most promising ones so that all can benefit. In the design of these programs, we've been talking a lot with our stakeholders in the community. We've gotten a lot of input and incredible suggestions from many of you here in the audience. And what we are aiming to do is to take a very strategic view of the R&D infrastructure and the programs that are being developed specifically around what's the value proposition for participants who will, who will be the be participating in these programs, benefiting from these programs, or perhaps wanting to receive and scale the output from these programs. The last thing I want to inform is, is to note is that this effort is informed by an industrial advisory committee. So there's 24 very distinguished individuals that represent a cross section of the, of the, of the, of the community, the semiconductor community. And they have been an incredible resource in taking a very close look and providing recommendations for the R&D program, not only for, for commerce and chips R&D, but across the government. And what has been truly spectacular is that they've been taking a national interest point of view and really working hard so that the United States can achieve this goal of keeping innovation leadership um, here in the US. Okay, so for the NSTC, there are, um, there are three basic challenges that we'll be addressing. And so we'll be looking at filling a, a, a resource gap that has been identified at, during before the passage of the CHIPS Act around prototyping, testing, and scaling. And so we need to fill this gap so that those facilities are available at prices and availability so that the barriers for which some companies are experiencing um, are reduced so that their ideas can be tested. We also have uh, identified barriers where researchers and developers, technology developers, do not have the type of access, ease of access to test facilities, equipment, or digital design tools and other resources where if the barriers toward access and cost and time to those tools was reduced, then the number of ideas that could be expressed and the number of participants and ideas could be, could be grown. And then without these, addressing these issues while also collectively identifying the most important challenges that we need to address as a, as a nation to lead the, the, lead the future of semiconductor technology, then, uh, then we need to invest in the, in the people and in the training so that those, the, the people who actually have the ideas can succeed. Now, late last year, we released a letter to the community about the NSTC. And so what we identified is the NSTC as a focal point for research and engineering throughout the semiconductor ecosystem and looking for this disruptive tech innovation that is on the most important technologies for the future. We outlined a number of different broad areas, broad uh, topics that we intended to address and then the vision and strategy paper from last week goes into more detail into those pieces. So if we're successful with the NSTC, then by the decade's end, the NSTC should be viewed throughout the world as an essential resource within the broad semiconductor ecosystem with a network of respected scientists and engineers, state-of-the-art facilities, effective programs, and demonstrated technical achievements. And so I'll preview a little bit in that we really intend this to be a national network and an ecosystem. What is really unprecedented about the CHIPS Act itself and the ambition of the NSTC within the R&D program is that the scope and scale, the dollar amounts are certainly unprecedented historically. Um, the breadth of the technology space that we need to address is just incredibly large. And most importantly, the focus on semiconductor technology, a critical foundation and future for, the, for all techno many technologies in the, in, for the United States provides that focus so that it is a national scale effort to bring and align and harmonize and scale this technology across the, 
the breadth of what the, the space covers. So the ecosystem for those who have regional centers and are already embarking on, on pushing innovation in semiconductor technology, then you can see the NSTC as an amplifier of those efforts. And what we need to do is to amplify locally pr promising areas that can be resources to the rest of the nation, and also to engage and include other parts of the nation where they can be starting to build other capabilities that we may need. The focus provided means that all of these activities need to be harmonized and aligned with a shared set of goals so that we will be able to keep the U.S. leadership in, in innovation. Um, let me just quickly go to the top line goals and I'll just run quickly through the elements of it and just reserve time for any questions that you may have. So the three top line goals, the things we'll be tracking to see if the NSTC is successful are here. The first one I've said many times is that we are extending U.S. technology in the foundational technology, innovation in the foundational technologies of the future. So although we are looking to increase the amount of research we want more people to perform research. We want that research to become more accessible, a um, lot more cost effective and faster. But the metric of success is the foundational technologies that have, for in the future, 5, 10, 15 years from now that we don't know about yet, were developed and scaled here in the United States. That's the metric of success. The second goal on the bottom left is that we want to reduce the time and cost of moving an idea into the commercial scale. And so I identified some of the barriers before, and so one of the things we'll be tracking is how much cheaper and faster is it, is it for new ideas to enter the actual practice. And the third goal is that none of this happens without people, and so we need to build and sustain a semiconductor workforce development ecosystem that looks at career pathways and not only at statistics of how many jobs remain to be filled. So if we need the innovators of the future, then we know they, we need to ha be able to have them come from any part of the country. It may be that they start in the trades and then find their way into becoming an innovator or an entrepreneur. And so building an ecosystem that is welcoming and thriving with full of opportunity is one that we can harmonize and share as a shared goal for the, for the NSTC. Okay, so I'll just go through some of the buckets of the types of programs that we envision the NSTC to cover. Um, around technology leadership, community assets, and workforce. So for technology leadership, then this is, this is really about bringing the community together and using the resources within the act for in-house and funded research. And we really are asking the NSTC to convene the community and have these discussions um, with representation from all across the industry, from the largest companies to the innovators, the smallest innovators, and ones with the, with the farthest reaching ideas, and to organize and develop important grand challenges and roadmaps, perhaps building on, among, uh, building on those that exist already, so that there are an alignment of where the most important challenges lie and al aligning the, the community together to go tackle them. There are other areas like standards and protocols, um, creating a dynamic environment where ideas can be exchanged, where you might find a collaborator that will help you make the next leap in technology that you didn't know existed, um, is the type of place and environment along with the resources that we want the NSTC to create. Around community assets, um, there are a number of, of areas that we have heard from the community um, about if there were shared resources to elevate all boats, as it were, a tide that elevates all the boats, in that if there is a, a number of, if there is a pool of shared resources, then that lowers the barrier for entry for people who want to have new ideas. And so some ideas that are in the vision and strategy paper include um, a chiplet space, um, a design enablement gateway where access to design tools and the types of data and resources you might need can be at a much lower cost. Um, data sets, which are extremely valuable if they are pre-competitive to enhance your competitive work, for example. Um, and also physical assets like technical centers, which will have the, the capabilities for prototyping, research, and experimentation, and also create this environment where these ideas can be shared in a pre-competitive environment so that the ideas can be tested and then commercialized when they're ready. Okay, so I'm going to need someone's help with that window. Okay, thank you. 
Um, on these technical centers, so these are physical assets of which there is a lot of uh, discussion about, about what types of resources and facilities are most necessary. And the only thing I'll point out here is that we have a category at the bottom which are more large scale uh, facilities for prototyping such as a baseline CMOS R&D line or an advanced packaging pilot facility that would be supported by the advanced packaging program. And this will have, these will be intersections of many different types of efforts that are pretty clear for what those purposes are. And then we have a concept that has been suggested by many, many uh, members of the community around technical centers that could be much more focused and organized around particular technology areas um, or different types of ideas. This is not an exhaustive list. It is not a fully uh, representative list and it's not a prioritization list. But you can see things like memory, power, um, RF and analog or design tool focus um, or bioelectronics. Like these are just examples of where there may be a future um, benefit for, the, for, the, for there to be a center of capability that could draw and drive innovation. The workforce programs are really to enhance this, nature, this key idea I'm trying to describe, which is to harmonize the industry as well as the educational and training institutions. So there can be an agreement on basic ideas of what is a high quality training program. How can we know that those training programs will lead to career success and effectiveness for the company? How can we ensure and find best practices so that there's outreach to traditionally underrepresented groups? Uh, there are pockets all around the country who have no idea that semiconductor technology and, and the industry has all these opportunities for them. And then not only that first entry part, of course, but also to thrive and stay within the industry through career pathways. Okay. We do envision that the NSTC is a major focal point and convening body, and so we would like essentially everyone to want to be and find value in being a part of the NSTC. Whether you are just learning about technology and just gaining access to ideas and what's happening, all the way to the most experienced practitioners who can find resources and environment where they can try out their most exciting ideas and be able to take that back into their own commercial, commercialization and um, um, efforts. And so you can see this is basically an exhaustive, it is an exhaustive list of everyone we can think of to be able to both contribute and to benefit from the NSTC. Um, this chart is a little complicated, but the main thing we wanted to convey is that the government is working together to make sure that the different components, the ones that you heard about earlier today, um, not only from NSF and DOD, but also in DOE and other agencies, and that we are working um, earnestly and daily to make sure that those programs can be connected together so that there can be leveraged in ways that both benefit those resources as well as the members of the NSTC. Okay, the last section I'll have is on the governance and how we're going to send it up, set it up. I won't go into what these two, um, these quotes, uh, these efforts are, are showing here. We'll just say that we received a lot of input from the community about the best way to organize and structure the NSTC. And the main conclusion is that the NSTC uh, was overwhelmingly recommended to be an independent, purpose-built organization to operate the NSTC. So in order to, because of the size and scale of the program, we really needed, um, the community believed that there needed to be an organization that was dedicated and designed toward this purpose. It has a lot of characteristics that'll be needed. It needs to provide leadership, Vision, be visionary, um, a neutral party and trusted, driven by science and technology. Certainly dedicated to the public interest and we are designing it to be long lasting so it can be a continued engine of innovation, not just a short term project that can fill some gaps in the, in the near term. So the basic steps for how we're going to get there is that also last week we released a federal register notice that uh, calling for nominations for a selection committee and the selection committee will have one job, which is to um, nominate and build a board uh, who will incorporate the nonprofit that will become the NSTC. So if you haven't seen that FRN, please go to chips.gov. And if you have um, individuals that you think could help us with this task, which is to select a board, and that board will stand up the, the organization, um, it closes on May 10th next week. So please do uh, send us who you think could do, this, do the best job for that. Okay, um, the basic structure of the NSTC, although it's national in scope, is very uh, well within the norms of how you would run the public-private partnership and consortium. Um, and I think I did this step already. 
Um, and then uh, let me just note that we hope that we'll be able to have an incorporated organization sometime this summer, and then we will start to build an agreement with them, building up membership, and so we're, we are aiming for being operational. The NSTC will be able to be starting its activities um, by the end of the calendar year if everything works out the way we want. For other components to look forward, um, please go to chips.gov. You can find out more updates on both the incentives and the R&D programs. Um, the next things that we will have coming up are publishing the summary of the RFI responses for the Manufacturing USA RFI. The metrology program is, 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 is about to get up and running and to be able to articulate their strategy and their plans. And then a lot more to come through the summer into the fall. Okay, so thank you again very much for um, inviting me here. And uh, certainly there's a lot of areas I hope you can see where regions can both participate and benefit and contribute to the overall focus that is the NSTC. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, do we have time for some questions? Okay. Yes, please. A natural question that people would have is how is this different from Semitech? And I think from what you've described, it sounds like it would be much broader and much more connected to workforce development. It, is that the case or? Um, yeah, I'd say the, you know, the scope of, this, of the NSTC is far broader than, than Semitech overall. Um, the, uh, the other part is that the technology space today is just far more complex and integrated than it was in the, in the original days or even the ending days of Semitech as well. Um, and the focus on, of Semitech was, was really heavy on the, on the semiconductor technology companies themselves, and there's a greater range of them at that time within the chip production um, space. So times are different as well as the size and scale and breadth and ambitions are different. We have learned a lot from Semitech. There are a lot of things Semitech did, was very successful in and, and articulated a model for what, could be, what, could, what benefits could come from that. And so we're certainly taking those lessons to heart. But, but, uh, but in general, yes, the, it's inspired by Semitech and its, and its accomplishments, and, but the scale and ambition and the size and the, and the focus for today's day and age is, is very different. Thank you. Yes. Eric, thank you very much for your um, leadership, your presentation today, and of course your, your, your leadership. Um, uh, innovation and manufacturing, R&D and manufacturing are closely connected in the innovation space. Can you say something about the relationship between the incentives, pro the incentive program and the R&D program and how those two will work together, reinforce one another, and so forth. Sure, so it's a, not a, obviously not an accident that the incentives program and the R&D program were put together and put in the same agency as well. Um, and certainly the Secretary and, and Director Lacasia has spoken a lot about the importance of if you don't have actual manufacturing, then the innovation does start to, start to decline, and that's the coupling together that goes back and forth to each other. Um, certainly, the incentives program is really focused on the short-term onshoring of fab facilities in the U.S., and the value proposition for R&D is to make sure that's sustained and stays here in the United States. And so we need to, there are ways, and there's a lot of active work between the two programs. For, for example, in the NOFO, one of the selection criteria is around contributions and participation in the R&D ecosystem. Now that benefits the R&D program because of leading edge capabilities that could be made use for, for R&D. Um, it's not specified that's still in the, in the negotiation stage. Um, but as the R&D program has a responsibility that the returns of that investment from the innovation infrastructure that we provide, if we are not providing the leading edge technology that the fabs and the manufacturers need or want, um, then, uh, then we wouldn't have fulfilled our part of the agreement. So that's sort of, that's the closed loop that goes around. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I think that's a great uh, introduction to the next panel. And if, you could, if the members of that panel could step forward, please. Thank you.
right, good afternoon, people. I hope everybody can hear me back there, and especially online. Apparently, there's quite a number of you online. I do have a tendency to speak into my collar, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sri Ramaswamy. I am a senior advisor to Secretary Gina Raimondo at Commerce. Um, I have been in my role for a little over two years now. Uh, officially, I am driving technology and industrial policy uh, for the Secretary and for Commerce. Uh, unofficially, as many of you know, over the last couple of years, uh, we've been focused on this thing called the CHIPS Act, uh, which has really, you know, I think what, what uh, has taken up most of my time has been helping the Secretary drive the agenda for the CHIPS Act and for semiconductor policy broadly, both with the industry in terms of understanding needs and trends, uh, with the Hill, with Congress, in terms of defining the policy and shaping the legislation, uh, and then also working um, with uh, various other stakeholders uh, to make sure that we are, uh, we are co correctly um, sizing and scoping this program. Uh, it's a very ambitious program, and so we're making sure that even within commerce, people understand the, uh, the scope of the program and how to define success in the long run. One of the early questions that the Secretary asked me to go think about was, if you looked back at this program in 15 years, how would we know that we have succeeded? And so a lot of the work that Commerce has been doing in the last two years has been to try to answer that question. Uh, I am happy to report that you know, we are now filling up the team. We've got some very capable leaders who are now driving the implementation. You met one of them just now, Eric Lin, who's driving the R&D program. Um, some of you also know Mike Schmidt, who is the director of the CHIPS program office and who is uh, running the 39 billion manufacturing incentives program. And as Eric said, uh, we do see both the manufacturing and the R&D programs as, as two sides of the same coin. They're reinforcing each other, and the Secretary has been very clear about that from the very beginning. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in the last couple of years in, in my time at Commerce is that in the discussions and the framing of the CHIPS Act, it's often framed as a federal incentive program to create incentives for the private sector to make R&D and manufacturing investments. Now that is, that is a correct framing, but it's not quite a complete framing, right? Because it misses out this really important third party, this ecosystem of regional, state, and local actors who are sometimes governments, sometimes nonprofits and universities, sometimes consortia of companies, and there's, there's quite a rich network of that ecosystem. And so we at Commerce have always, from the very beginning, thought of this as almost a uh, it's almost a three-party arrangement between the commerce chips program, the private sector, and this network in the middle. And uh, if you look at, for instance, one of the first papers that we issued back in September of 2022, right after the president had signed the CHIPS Act, uh, we issued a strategy paper that talked about some of these broad goals for chips implementation. And in that paper, we had a couple of remarks, and I just wanted to call that out. Uh, the law requires that applicants demonstrate they have secured incentives from state or local governments. The department expects to prioritize support for projects that include such state and local incentive packages that have the potential for large spillover benefits that are based on performance and that maximize regional and local competitiveness. And so we called that out early on uh, as our way of signaling to folks that that regional ecosystem really matters because, and we want to think about this from a competitiveness standpoint. We laid out a bunch of examples of how you could think about these sorts of initiatives. But you know, the challenge with that is, particularly when it comes to innovation ecosystems, it is really hard to define up front what makes a regional innovation ecosystem successful, right? We all know the stories of Silicon Valley and, and the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina and the Bell Labs ecosystem and Route 128 in Boston. We all know those stories. Um, but we also know that several of these initiatives have been tried and have failed. Um, some have succeeded, but only to a point and never really caught fire. Some have succeeded and then eventually faded away and died. And so one of the things that I'm hoping to get from this panel discussion is a sense from the folks who are going to be joining me how do you solve these problems? How do you identify upfront some of the key ingredients that make a regional research ecosystem successful? And what does that mean for both the participants in that ecosystem and for folks in the private sector who will be engaging in that ecosystem and for folks at commerce and the federal government? 
who will be part of that arrangement to think about how to build these partnerships. Now, the good news is that on this panel, you have a set of folks who have been thinking and working on these issues for years, for decades. In fact, I did some quick math and I will tell you, I have checked this, there's over 100 years of collective experience on this panel. Not counting me, if you added me, you'll probably still have barely more than 100. Um, and so part of it is the collective wisdom from this group, but part of it I think also is the fact that each of these individuals is, is unique in a certain way, both in terms of their individual expertise and their experience, and in terms of the organization that they lead or represent. And that organization is also unique in the role that it plays in this ecosystem. Right? And so, you know, certainly in my two years, when I think about these individuals and their organizations, it is really hard for me to go and find a peer organization or a peer individual and say, look, this, in, this organization is sort of, you know, the US version of that organization or this state's version of that organization. These, there just doesn't seem to be a peer to any of these folks and their organizations on this panel. And so I'm really excited to have this panel discussion with these folks. The way this is going to work is I'm going to call on, on my colleagues one by one to come and offer some, some thoughts uh, about their experience, about the questions at hand, and about their organization. Uh, and once that's done, I'm going to call all four of them up to this panel and we'll have a discussion here with some Q&A. Um, certainly I have some questions of my own, but I will make sure that the audience you know, gets, gets enough of a chance to ask questions. So I'll start with um, my first colleague, Luke Vandenov, is president and CEO of IMEC. IMEC started as the Inter-University Microelectronics Consortium back in 1984, and Luke has been there since the very beginning. He is one of the founders. He is now today CEO and president. Um, IMEC is the world's largest R&D partnership in semiconductors. It counts among its members and its partners pretty much everybody in the semiconductor ecosystem. That includes people from the chip manufacturing community, the supply chain, the tool companies, the software companies, the hyperscalers, the auto companies. Um, Luke has spent a lot of time in the, in, in the recent past working on what he calls application-oriented research, so moving IMX agenda uh, into specific verticals and thinking about the research challenges for semiconductors from the perspective of those verticals in healthcare, in energy, in other sorts of verticals. Um, like I said, Luke has, you know, he's been there since the very beginning and under his stewardship, IMEC is now today grown from that infant of 1984 to an organization that has over 5,500 people, um, close to a billion dollars in euros in annual operating budgets and locations and research work going on all over the world, including two locations, I believe, here in the United States. Luke, floor's yours. Uh, thank you, Sri. Um, so I was asked to kick off this, uh, this panel and uh, say a few words uh, first about, uh, about IMEC. Um, and, uh, and then during the panel, we will address some of the questions uh, Sri uh, has uh, asked. Uh, but, uh, but after this wonderful introduction, basically, you, <laughs> you already mentioned most of the things I was going to mention in the introduction uh, about, uh, about IMEX, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, okay, let me uh, start with um, kind of uh, uh, focusing on what we believe are the key assets that made IMEC to what it is uh, today. Uh, and, uh, and I believe the three key assets are, on the one hand, the infrastructure which we've built up over the four decades of our existence since 1984. And uh, uh, we, that, that kind of it was brought together in, uh, in, in two major clean rooms, uh, about 12,000 square meter, uh, in which we, we, do, we have installed uh, kind of leading edge tools from basically all major uh, manufacturers. So we work very closely in very close partnership with all major tool suppliers. Uh, uh, a lot of them are US, a lot of them are Europeans, uh, like ASML, uh, also Japanese. Uh, and we, we have uh, kind of uh, made IMEC as a kind of a hub where a lot of these suppliers are testing out a lot of their newest uh, innovations because they need access to this infrastructure to, to test out how their 
uh, process module works in combination with, uh, with the other modules. Um, the most important asset, though, uh, I think, is uh, the team that we built out. Step by step, over 40 years, we built out a team that I believe is, is, is uh, extremely experienced. Uh, um, about 5,500 people, including about 700 residents from the companies with whom we work, um, and, uh, and also 850 PhD students uh, uh, who, uh, who are obtaining their PhD from one of the universities with whom we work, um, but they do their research uh, program uh, uh, full-time at, uh, at IMIC, leveraging our infrastructure. This is a very effective way to build very close interactions uh, with uh, and partnerships with universities. And the third key asset is clearly the ecosystem. Uh, Sri already uh, referred to it. Uh, we're, we're kind of working these days with, with virtually any company that is active in the semiconductor value chain. Uh, this is, these are all the major uh, IDMs, uh, the foundries, the uh, memory companies, um, all of the top ones, uh, uh, but, uh, but also the fabulous companies and the hyperscalers, uh, because more and more we see this need to kind of connect design and system know-how with technology know-how. It's not like one roadmap that defines the future. There is a, there is a lot of, of divergence in these roadmaps, and we have to optimize the technology to a specific uh, system requirements. And so we need to know the system. Uh, the system uh, we need to be experts also on the system side. Uh, but we also work with, um, uh, with uh, as I mentioned, with the universities to feed in a lot of new ideas, new innovation, fundamental understanding. Uh, we work with the suppliers to build up the infrastructure. Um, and we also have built out a model that I think is very inclusive. We work with the biggest companies, but we also work with hundreds of startups uh, and provide a low barrier access uh, uh, to high-end technology. Because for startups, it's really hard to, to get access to this leading edge technology. And so we have to lower the barrier for access by providing them easy access to the ecosystem, but also by providing very cost effective, uh, effective access. Um, and, uh, and so we've built out uh, quite a lot of models uh, uh, to work on that. So in this way, these are some of the key, key assets that made IMIC to what, what it is today, I believe. Um, Sri referred already to, to our, our uh, budget evolution. So we started in 1984. Um, we grew to an organization with, we started with a team of 70 people. We grew to an organization, 5,500 people, budget of, uh, of close to a billion dollars. Um, majority of that revenue comes from direct industry support. 75% uh, uh, comes from industry directly, which I think is a testimony of the value we bring. Um, about 25% comes from government support, either the local government uh, or the, the European government, uh, uh, European Commission. Um, uh, and, and I believe this, but, and, and what you can see here from this graph is also that this, this <coughs> government support was also very sustained over the entire lifetime of IMIC. In fact, it grew over the lifetime. And this is very important because it allows us to invest in, uh, in, in long-term uh, R&D programs, which today for industry are a little early, but are going to become important five to 10 years from now. Uh, and having that sustained commitment, long-term commitment also allows us to build up a long-term strategy. Uh, so I believe this is also a very important element for, for the NSTC setup. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, <clears throat> we kind of, uh, the core of what we do is really on the semiconductor technology, the chip technology. That's the enabler, and that's where our core competence is. Um, but um, whereas uh, the focus of the applications for chips in the past uh, decades have mostly been the ICT world, uh, we now see phenomenal opportunities in, in basically any industry. Um, but um, but as I mentioned before, um, the technology really needs to be tuned to a specific application. A solution for, uh, for an application in healthcare will be very different from the automotive uh, uh, solutions. Uh, of course, there's a lot of commonality in the basic technology, but you have to tune the technology towards these applications. Uh, and, 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 and this also requires an investment into uh, understanding those application fields. Um, 
and, uh, and, and areas which uh, are, of course, very hot topics these days are, are the automotive sector. Um, but, uh, but we believe future uh, areas, uh, fields uh, like healthcare, are going to be uh, also extremely important. So with this, uh, this is uh, the short introduction I wanted to give, and I'm looking forward to, to the panel session where we can uh, talk more about uh, how to connect what we're doing with the NSTC, what are the similarities, what are the, dif the differences. So thank you. All right, thank you, Luke. Uh, I'd like to call in Dave Anderson next. Dave is the president of NY Creates. Um, I've known about NY Creates, obviously, for a long time, but it was only two weeks ago that I realized NY Creates is an acronym. Uh, and it stands for the New York Center for Research, Economic Advancement, Technology, Engineering, and Science. Correct? Yes. And the reason I call that out is because each of those words has a, has a unique and distinct value. And sitting here at Commerce, sitting in the Secretary's office, I will tell you, uh, the Commerce leadership and the administration understands the value of each of those words. You will often see in the Secretary's remarks when she talks about R&D that she makes a distinction between scientific R&D and engineering R&D. Because she understands, I think, the difference, you know, especially for an industry like semiconductors where there's such a long learning curve uh, and there's such a long process engineering curve uh, that requires a lot of engineering in the real world. Uh, there is a difference in commitment, there's a difference in capital, there's a difference in the, in the incentive structures that you need to provide for the different types of R&D programs. And so um, Dave runs, as I said, NY Creates. NY Creates is the home of Albany Nanotech. Um, Albany Nanotech is really you know, the hub for New York. It, it anchors a really diverse ecosystem from, uh, that includes not just IBM and, and Tokyo Electron and, and um, applied elect, uh, materials in Albany. Uh, it extends to global foundries in Malta. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the ecosystem. I'm sure it actually extends north of the border into Canada as well. Um, Dave was, uh, before his role at, um, at NY Creates, he was with Semi Americas. Semi, as many folks know, is the industry association that represents the equipment and material suppliers to the semiconductor industry. Dave, all yours. Thanks, Shri. It's a pleasure to be here and, and represent New York Creates and, and all that we're doing, but also to hear all the other speakers and panelists on what's going on and how we're supporting the overall CHIPS Act, but most importantly, uh, from the perspective of what we're talking about today, the NSTC, the National Semiconductor Technology Center. So I was pre pleased this morning when I came in to see a few copies of Chuck and Thomas's book, Regional Renaissance, How New York capital region has become a nanotechnology powerhouse. Uh, it really talks about uh, the clustering effect and, and the importance of that and how it evolved in, in Albany and, and how we've really become that center of technology for New York. So I thought if I uh, get any difficult questions today, I can just look up the answer in, in this book. But I, I want to talk a little bit about, as, as Shri said, it is an acronym. It's the New York Center for um, research, Economic Advancement, Technology, Engineering, and Science. And it really does embody what we do in, in Albany Nanotech, but more broadly across the state of New York as New York creates. We have three primary legs of our mission at New York Creates, and it really is accelerating innovation, and that's the R&D infrastructure. The second is economic development, particularly for the state of New York, but also the rest of the country. And, and the third is education and workforce development. So I have the advantage of having Taffy go earlier, so if you were here and saw her slides, she talked a lot about the, the innovation ecosystem that is engaged in, in Albany Nanotech, uh, including our, our major industry partners of IBM, uh, Applied Materials, Tokyo Electron, and all the other suppliers we engage with and many of the device companies, but also that cluster that's around us in Global Foundries, in Micron, in uh, Wolfspeed, and even our engagements with Bromont uh, north of the border, and, and so forth. So, so really driving that 
innovation economy, if you will, from the R&D perspective is the first uh, part of our mission. The, the second then is economic development. And New York Creates actually operates about 10 sites across the state of New York. And uh, the most relevant, of course, to NSTC is Albany Nanotech, the, the site in Albany, as well as our assembly test and packaging facility uh, for photonics in Rochester. And it's part of the AIM Photonics Institute. But really, as we t heard earlier about the, the Silicon Heartland, and we heard a lot from Micron on why they selected New York, I think what we're finding from a clustering effect, it's not just in the Albany capital region, but that Interstate 90 corridor has become a very attractive expansion of that cluster because of the likes of Global Foundries, uh, Wolf Speed in Utica, Micron Building in Syracuse, Intel in Columbus, the likes of analog devices, TI, on semiconductor for, further to the east. That I-90 I corridor is very attractive for suppliers of both equipment and materials and other uh, consumables and other engagements with the industry to build that cluster ac across that. They're, they can only be a few hours away from any one of those companies. So the state of New York is uniquely located, the upstate in particular, uh, to service all of those companies at the same time. And that's really our economic development focus, is bringing jobs and uh, uh, the economy uh, back to New upstate New York. And then the third is e education and workforce development. Our genesis is, is from the University of Albany. Uh, we have SUNY Polytechnic uh, University on site, uh, which embodies the, uh, the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, so CNSE and uh, that is actually being transferred back to the University of Albany. So we've, over history, gone by these names. So when you think of SUNY Pauli, you think of CNSE, you think of UAlbany, and New York creates, it's all that entity there in Albany. But in addition to our engagement with university researchers, not just from the SUNY system, but other major research universities across the country, we also engage with community college and, and technology training programs, not just for technicians, but also for the workforce in the construction trades and so forth that are required to develop that, that further ecosystem. And uh, we also house the New England Advanced Technology Education Center for technician training. And we've initiated what we call VETSTEP, which is uh, a program being, bringing returning veterans from the industry into the workforce. So really an engagement across all of those activities. If you look to Albany Nanotech uh, in particular, which is uh, the most advanced public-private research center for semiconductors in the US, you find that as you listen to Luke, we have very similar capabilities. Uh, we have a 20-year 20, 20 history of R&D partnerships. Uh, we have over $15 billion of capital investment in this site with about 120, 150,000 square feet of clean room, very similar in size. And, you know, litho capabilities down through current leading edge in, in UV with full 300 millimeter flow. So we really have capabilities uh, that others in the U.S. do not have. We also have a, a successful history of managing consortia programs. Uh, the last programs of Semitech were embodied in, in our facilities. Um, we are the home of the AIM Photonics Manufacturing Institute uh, for the Manufacturing USA program. And we have other academic partners and other research programs uh, that are going on there. And in addition, we do have a long history of advancing and identifying industry break, breakthroughs. Um, so really what we have there is a, a core capabilities that support many technologies. We have multiple partners on site. Taffy showed, I don't know, a couple of dozen of them, and there's even more working on different technologies, but they're all leveraging a shared access facility at, at the Albany Nanotech site. So we're very well known for advanced logic processing, thanks to IBM and other partners that are driving that but we've developed uh, next generation memory technologies, neuromorphic computing and quantum computing technologies. We're working on bio devices. We have a full heterogeneous integration line, both in Albany and in Rochester, uh, to support advanced packaging. Uh, 
integrated photonics through the AIM Photonics Institute, and also working on future technologies like quantum and, and other areas. In addition to that, we've uh, supported power electronics uh, for wolf speed and others. So really a broad array of technologies that we work there, but it's all done on a full flow 300 millimeter line uh, that uh, is one of the largest facilities in the US for R&D. So as, as Luke talked, and we get many questions all the time, well, how does uh, New York Creates uh, compete or compare to IMEC? And that's a really interesting question, and I thought I'd try to answer that, and thanks to Joe for, for uh, helping with this. But, uh, you know, IMEC scope is really looking out uh, 10 plus years in, in many cases, uh, in plus four, five, seven, uh, nodes out. So they're doing a lot of unit process, a lot of research, core development, narrowing the field of potential possibilities. As Luke said, driven by end market application and what are the technologies that need to be developed to identify that. You come to New York Creates, we're working in the four to six year time frame. So N plus two, N plus three, where we're taking that narrowed scope of technologies and applying it to research that's gonna be closer to manufacturing. So yes, we have some overlap. We certainly have capabilities that overlap, but our, our direction and objectives are very synergistic. And so it's, it's really interesting to be here with Luke today and, and talk about those synergies. But I'll leave it at that and say thank you. Thank you, Dave. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting my 10,000 steps in today. Um, I'd like to introduce our next colleague, uh, Dorota Greiner Brzezinska. Dorota is a distinguished university professor at The Ohio State University. Um, she has a, anybody who knows her would know, she has a long and pioneering history of research in global positioning systems and global navigation systems. She is also one of the leaders of OSU's Knowledge Enterprise, uh, which is a program to develop the research capabilities of researchers and research teams at OSU and also expand OSU's research portfolio uh, and expand the societal impact of that research portfolio. Um, she has been a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. President Biden recently appointed her to the National Science Board. Uh, but what makes it especially exciting for us to have her here today is because of a relatively new organization for which she is the driving force, and it's called the Midwest Semiconductor Network. This is a coalition of universities driven by OSU with the goal of setting up a a wider ecosystem in the Midwest to focus on research, training, and capability building across the ecosystem. This is exactly the sort of coalition that commerce envisions uh, as seeing, uh, you know, as being core to this, this wider CHIPS agenda of building regional ecosystems that have scale and sustainability over time. Dorota. Right. Um, thank you very much for this kind introduction, Sri. As um, he just said, I come from the Silicon heartland, heartland to be. And I would like to um, talk about a new organization, as Sri already um, um, essentially sold my thunder. Um, but I would like to tell you a story, how it um, has been formed and where we are right now and what we aspire to be in the future. And of course, um, and, um, the way we would like to engage with all of you and others uh, who are not even in the room. So let me begin by saying that the last 70 years of semiconductor innovation has been, um, have been extraordinary, right? We went from just a few um, transistors in silicon to literally billions of them on a single wafer, and those are really approaching atomic scale and are being now uh, essentially uh, put in three dimensions. So the packaging process right now, the integration process, I should say, is becoming more and more complex. So the new materials, new design, and the manufacturing process can really, cannot be really um, separated. Hence, the drive for these new ecosystems that all those components would be covered. 
Now, extremely important part of this ecosystem is, of course, which has to be developed in parallel, is the workforce development. And this is when academic um, institutions like myself come to play. Uh, better yet, um, entire pipeline of academic institutions when we try to cover um, community colleges, four-year colleges, uh, R1s, R2s, and, and also a diversity including um, HBCUs and other minority saving institutions. This gives us not just the pipeline for workforce, but also diversity of perspectives and diversity of geographies. So um, <clears throat> aside from the CHIPS Act, um, which we have been uh, watching for about two years now in development, uh, the tremendous motivator for Ohio State and the great state of Ohio, of course, was the announcement made last January, I'm sorry, January 22 by Intel of bringing 20 billion and two fabs to Ohio, which essentially everyone I take very enthusiastically. And frankly, um, even until now, probably no one in this audience is thinking of Midwest as the Silicon Heartland, but I would say not yet. Just watch us and we'll see what we can do. So um, the investment by Intel really shined a light um, at Ohio first, um, essentially telling us, um, of telling the world about our capabilities and opportunities that we can create. I want to emphasize, number one, the centrality of geography. We are really very centrally located, very easily accessible. Uh, we have very diverse um, demographics. And let's face it, the, um, the cost of living is still very affordable. We have extremely broad and, and deep academic base across the state. We have legacy industries like uh, mobility and um, uh, aerospace, both of them very actively and quickly um, transitioning to electrification and autonomy. So here is a huge base of users. Um, we also have a growing um, which, doesn't, which of course helps a lot to grow in venture capital um, environment um, across the at least major metropolitan areas in Ohio. And of course we have Columbus, Ohio, when it's always sunny and 72. Um, so after the uh, announcement coming from Intel, we took a good close look at what Ohio State can do and of course started working across the border um, well, not yet across the border, across the county borders with the schools in the state of Ohio, trying to understand how collectively we can put together our expertise, our experience, our um, instructions, but also the training facilities. And of course, uh, those of you who uh, work with academics, you know that most of the time the research institutions have just about the, who focus on semiconductor. Uh, would have just about a good base for research and development, but not exactly for training, right? So the shortage across the um, state and across the region and across academia generally is the, um, is the access to fab. So again, bringing Intel to Ohio and the region is a tremendous opportunity um, for not only state of Ohio, but also um, other um, universities and our um, in neighboring states. So after we took a closer look and determined that Ohio State has really great um, history of really um, doing research across the stack from physics to materials to design, um, we actually, and of course producing a very advanced um, workforce at the engineering to uh, masters to PhD levels, um, we realized that of course this is not what the industry wants immediately. Uh, the industry, particularly the new fabs, would really need about 3,000 or more technicians to start with, and maybe um, entry engineers. And over time, of course, um, the R&D environment is, um, is needed, and of course the well-developed uh, well, uh, advanced workforce would be needed. So with that, um, like I said, we started um, discussions internally with this, within the state of Ohio, academics, economic development, and the government. We assessed the capabilities, and then academics sit together and said, well, you know, uh, if we want to have a, a, a silicon um, heartland, then we need to look into beyond um, Ohio uh, and, and see what we can do partnering with others. We fully understand Intel is first, but not the last in the region and not everything would go to Ohio. There will be also supply chain, there will be users, there will be other industries. We've had this this morning from industry partners from Intel particularly that a lot of companies are talking to them and they want to move to the region, which is great news. So with that, um, Ohio State has called for the 
for the meeting of the minds. And um, last year in, uh, in April, we called about 12, actually exactly 12, uh, regional universities and colleges. We looked to the state up north we always fight with. I won't even use the name and Indiana plus Ohio. So three states came together, um, about 100 uh, participants, academics and academic leaders. And the question was very, very simple in a sense. What do we have collectively that can be leveraged? What are the gaps that we have that we can try to collectively fill? Can we work together? And so after a um, day and a half of deliberation and discussion about the workforce development, about various components of R&D, we came to a conclusion that we actually have a lot. Everyone was very excited and our um, leaders were also very fired up to actually start making this happen. So as a result, uh, 12 um, colleges and universities signed the MOU and um, essentially um, all of the schools um, in this partnership have created a standing council. Ohio State was voted a leader and we started discussions across the board looking a, uh, we essentially were task force oriented for so task force number one, workforce development, task force number two, governance, membership, and extension of the partnership, task force number three, um, R&D opportunities and how we position universities um, collectively for success. Now, having said that, I want to emphasize that I personally and many of my colleagues follow the mantra that collaboration is the new competition, and not, of course, everyone will agree with that, um, but we brace up for patience and we brace up for demonstrating that actually collaboration can bring much more value than competing all the time. So anyway, with that, I want to I wanna follow. Um, after signing the MOU, um, we have essentially started discussions, uh, like I said earlier, what would be the platform when we can put together our assets in terms of curriculum, in terms of the infrastructure, and in terms of the development. Of course, what helped state of Ohio and Ohio schools was the significant investment from Intel and I want to recognize that almost 18 million dollars now invested in three years in eight large curriculum development projects and some research projects. Uh, 80 uh, colleges and universities from the state of Ohio are involved in those projects. So <clears throat> building on that um, and the, the budding partnerships uh, we actually cre um, call for the next uh, workshop just past, past March 2023 um, and this time we really squarely decided to focus on workforce development as a lower hanging fruit for all of us because it probably requires less competition than usual R&D competition. We all went to Lorraine County Community College which is the central location in the, um, in the area but this time I want to tell you we had 150 participants and it was academia, economic development from a few states and also number of representatives from industry. Industry. Now, by that time, I want to also emphasize we have uh, had 20 plus members and by today we have 31 members and we have grown to five states. So let me show you, I think I have a geography now. This is the membership. This is the way for us to innovate at scale and speed. This is really uh, through partnerships and the geography um, is shown in this slide. Uh, you can see the names of the universities and colleges um, all across five states. We added Illinois, we added um, uh, Kentucky and, and also um, and I'm sorry, in, you know, in Kentucky, we had three states at the beginning. I, I still don't want to say Michigan, but I, <laughs> I did already. Um, anyway, so you can see the pipeline is very clear there. Community colleges, a number of HBCUs. They are four-year colleges. They are R2s and R1s. And all those um, organizations are eager to collaborate and eager to create. We are currently actually working on that collective platform when we can uh, provide the curriculum that we have. Some of the universities already have um, some of those programs. Ohio State is one of them. We are launching a number of stackable certificates just this fall and working on a um, degree program. So what is the structure? I want to emphasize that the MOU did not really put any money obligation on anyone. This is 
purely voluntarily and it's driven by academics right now. We've got to the conclusion very recently that, um, you know, based on volunteering is great, but we need to have permanent staff. And Ohio State is planning to hire a permanent um, a person, at least one or two to start with, to essentially breathe and, and drive this, this MSN and drive um, the development and, and, and partnership um, establishment um, over the next couple of years. So I mentioned we have a standing council, but this is just an advisory body. Now with 31 organization, we needed a smaller, more agile organization which could actually be able to make decisions. So we have established governing board. Um, this is a decision-making body. And again, Ohio State was voted um, to lead as a lead institution. We just established the industry board in, in April. And essentially the objective is to bring industry to help us jointly create a value proposition which is the best for industry. Um, our ongoing activities, as you can see in the slide, really is this development of the information sharing platform I mentioned. We want to be the one-stop shop for industry, everything in one place. You could see who we are, what assets we have, what courses we teach, and how you can stack the uh, certificates and <clears throat> towards degree programs and how we also work across the institutions. Uh, we also have, a, I mentioned earlier, task force which is looking into opportunities, how the network as a whole could participate in large federal opportunities. And we, we right now are working on the proposal to NSF, which is um, essentially just crafted for organizations like ours. This is all about networking in semiconductors. And I want to close by showing you um, the six logos. Um, I want to also emphasize that just this morning, Jim Evers called me and he said Intel Corporation is no longer in process. They actually are a member of our advisory board. And again, this is the example of how we started with the large academic um, network. Now we are bringing industry and would we'll be working over the next um, couple of months on the value proposition and inviting other partners. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dorota. And finally, let me ask uh, Phil Singerman to come up. Phil doesn't need any introductions to this group, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, he's been a trusted advisor on regional economic development to many policy institutes, to many technology initiatives. He has more than 35 years of technology-based economic development experience. He was the first CEO of the Ben Franklin Technology Partners of Southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, also of the Maryland Technology Development Corporation, both of which, if you don't know, are two of the longest lasting public-private partnerships in technology development and economic development in the US. Um, he was at Commerce for many years. He was the Assistant Secretary for Economic Development. He was also at NIST for many years. NIST, as you know, is the official home of the CHIPS program um, here at Commerce. And while at NIST, he spearheaded uh, the creation of the Manufacturing USA network and also led the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, both of which are good examples of that federal, state, industry, trilateral partnership that I talked about in my opening remarks. Phil, why don't you come on up? And what I'd ask is, once Phil is done with his remarks, if you can stay here on stage, Phil, and I'll ask my other colleagues to come up and take their seats and we can get into the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Sri, for actually introducing me. I appreciate that. I always, always like a little shout out. Um, and, but seriously, thank you for your leadership and dedication uh, to this program, these extraordinarily important national issues. And, and thanks to CSIS for organizing this panel. Um, I, I'm not a physical scientist. I'm a social scientist. So I'm going to bring a slightly different perspective to this discussion. Uh, and if uh, I had to frame it, I would uh, sp call it regional research ecosystems within the framework of industrial policy. And if my remarks were to have a title, it would be Laboratories of Democracy, American Style Industrial Policy. Although we sometimes question whether the United States, and in particular the national government, has pursued industrial policy, specifically the anointing of uh, individual companies as champions and then providing special privileges. Uh, Taiwan's uh, development of 
TSMC as an example. It is true that since the inception of the Republic, states have aggressively pursued such policies. You don't have to go back to Alexander Hamilton to ask about industrial policy. Just ask the governors of New York, Ohio, Texas, and Arizona. They all practice it. What the panels have described today is industrial policy, American style. And in this context, it is useful to remember that the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The phrase laboratories of democracy was popularized by Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in his 1932 dissenting opinion in the New State Ice Company versus Liebman. You can look it up if you'd like, it's very interesting. Brandeis wrote, there must be power in the states and the nation to remold through experimentation our economic practices and institutions to meet changing social and economic needs. It is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. For over 50 years, a handful of states have been the drivers behind the locations of semiconductor fabrications. These happy incidents of courageous states fundamentally limit the locations where the federal government will be able to support the fabrication of new fabs with CHIPS funding. The leading role of states is actually, uh, uh, states in determining lo locations is actually written into the CHIPS legislation. Eligibility for financial assistance from the Commerce Department requires an applicant to have been offered a covered incentive, a subsidy from a governmental agency. Already, Ohio has committed to Intel 2.3 billion and counting. New York has committed 6.1 billion to Micron. Arizona has long provided tax breaks, infrastructure investments, and workforce advancements to Intel and TSMC. We've heard about these initiatives, these positive initiatives today. Now, it is certainly true that there are probably more regions that have assets that can support regional research ecosystems. But it is also true that prior decisions by states to locate FABs have enabled them to create and strengthen their assets. We heard about it in this panel, we heard about it in the panel, the industry panel. Universities, supply chains, workforce development programs that comprise what we commonly think of as the components of a research ecosystem. Uh, Senator Kelly this morning described the Arizona uh, impact, um, and as I mentioned, uh, the uh, prior panels have also talked about it. What does this all mean for a federal policy that intends to promote regional research ecosystems and for the regions or states that want to participate? An example, for the federal government, it mean that, means that states and local governments need to be fully embraced, indeed encouraged, to bring forth their ideas and become full partners in policy planning. The lack of front-end engagement by states is reflected in the low number of state responses to the numerous RFIs, requests for information, that the Commerce Department has published requesting input on federal policy and programs. The Commerce Department has been very proactive in reaching out to the broader stakeholder community and universities, corporations, and industrial associations have responded, but states and other local governmental entities are largely absent. I know it, the federal government has met with, with the uh, Semiconductor Industry Association, the Semiconductor Research Corporation, SEMI, the uh, Manufacturing Association, the American Society for, um, uh, for in, uh, sorry, American uh, Semiconductor Innovation uh, uh, coalition. I don't know if the federal government has also met with the National Governors Association, the National Association of Counties, and the National League of Cities. If not, it should do so. For the states, it is important to proactively engage in the mechanisms that are made available for stakeholder input. As Eric Lynn discussed in his keynote, last week NIST's CHIP 
Office's R&D Office published a vision and strategy for the National Semiconductor Technology Center, NSTC, a public-private consortium that is the centerpiece of the CHIP's $11 billion R&D program. I encourage everyone to carefully read this document. As Eric noted, a key step in the establishment of the NSTC is a creation of a board of trustees that will run the NSTC. And last week, NIST issued a request for nominations for an independent selection committee to choose members of the board of trustees. The deadline for nominations is May 10th. Here is an opportunity for states to have influence. They should take advantage of it. States also have a leading role in the implementation of the CHIPS Act, both in the fabrication incentives and their relationship and impact to the regional research ecosystems. That will be a subject for the discussion of our panel as we move forward. Thank you very much. in the middle? All right, in the interest of time, so thank you all for those remarks. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to throw it open to the audience first. I do have a bunch of questions, but I think we have a break right after this, so I'm going to make sure that I keep these guys here to ask my questions. Um, but any questions in the audience first? And if you have any, please introduce yourself and your organization first, and, and then ask your question. All right, I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start with Dave. You talked about the three pillars that define uh, NY Creates. Could you talk a little bit more about how you think about success for you along those three pillars? Right? How do you how do you define success? How successful have you been? And what in the creation of NY Creates has allowed you to define that kind of success? Sure, sure, thank you. Well, you know, I think New York Creates is actually a true partnership of industry, academia, and government. And those three elements really help define our, our success. In particular, relying on our industry partners. Uh, they are kind of the foundation of our financial stability over time. They have large programs. Uh, some of them are focused specific on their own needs, but some are done collaboratively that has a broader industry impact. But over time, they provide the bulk of the financial support that, that enables the entity to continue. Uh, the academia provides long-term vision into uh, new technologies and, and new research. So starting with the local universities, that fed into some of the technologies that were developed early on, but today we work with, in, with uh, universities across the country and, and indeed uh, across the world in some cases in, in identifying new technologies for development. And then the state and government in particular, but the state, uh, I, you know, I look to uh, over five or six different governors over the course of the 20 years of our existence, every single one of them has supported uh, the infrastructure and investment in, in, in the development of the Albany Nanotech uh, facility and the industry itself uh, as an objective for economic growth in upstate New York. So today, uh, Senator Schumer, uh, Governor Hochul with the Green Chips Act and investment uh, in the industry has attracted Wolfspeed, has attracted Micron, and we see that continue to grow. And that's really the measure of success or, or those com companies coming in. But it's a continual uh, patient influx of, of, of government help and of course with the federal programs like AIM and other, other programs that uh, help sustain some new, new areas as well. <coughs> So that continual influx of, of public support, in a sense, right? I mean, in a sense, that's reflective. Uh, look of IMEC as well. You have, you know, the government has been playing a role for a while. Let me ask you. So you've talked about the the coordination of the overlap, um, or in some sense, the complementarity of IMEC and NSTC. Mm -hmm. But if I were to ask you from a regional ecosystem standpoint, you know, 
when we think about a regional innovation ecosystem, you would think about you know, a research hub, facilities, startup support, training programs for workers, maybe venture capital hubs. Um, in some sense, IMAC has all of the above within the organization, right? And so if you think about the US innovation ecosystem as let's say four or five different regional innovation hubs, how do you see IMAC interacting with each of those hubs given its kind of unique position in that ecosystem? Well, I believe that um, uh, overall, I think these CHIPS Acts are, are a phenomenal opportunity. But I think it's very important that we, we reach the goal, uh, and that is to accelerate the uh, technology leadership uh, and, and to strengthen the technology leadership uh, in, I would say, the Western world, because I think we have to, to look at it at, at the broader scale. And that's why I think we have to bring together the brightest possible minds, the, the best strengths that we have, um, and, uh, and, and, and as I said, I think we have to look at it in a, in a transatlantic uh, scope because, I mean, to be honest, we do more business with U.S. companies than even with, U, uh, with, with European companies. So, so it, it, I mean, it, this industry is characterized by, by a lot of uh, global partnerships and global collaborations. And I think in that context, coming to, to your question then uh, on, on how we can connect these regional uh, hubs is I think we have to connect the strengths uh, and identify the various strengths and then make sure that we build on this complementarity to create the, the best possible engine to, to make progress as fast as possible. Um, and, and I think built on complementarity is very important because if each region region globally in terms of continents, but even regions locally, are going to try to do the same thing and just copy and, 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 and repeat uh, the, the initiatives, then it's going to be very inefficient. Uh, it's actually going to reduce, in fact, the, the efficiency in the system from where we are today even, and then the CHIPS Act would result in kind of the opposite effect. It would even slow down innovation. So I think it's extremely important that we connect the strengths, identify the strengths of the various regions, and that's what we, what we, we, where we also want to contribute and complement with, with where we think we are strength and where we can kind of amplify the strengths of some of the regions by combining what we do best what, uh, what the various uh, regions do best. And, and in that sense, we are establishing several uh, uh, contacts and initiatives. Uh, I mean, we just signed an MOU with Purdue University earlier, earlier today because I, I believe that, as, uh, as you mentioned, in the Midwest, there is, I think, a very nice cluster of top excellent universities. Uh, and I think it's very important that we leverage those strengths uh, and, and connect them and also by by connecting what we're doing, bring some of the assets we have into, into scope uh, and, uh, and make sure that we, by doing that, can kind of elevate also some of the, the unique strengths that are available in, in the various regions. Uh, same way as what uh, Dave referred to in terms of the complementarity between what New York Creates does and what we do. Well, by creating that formal link, we can become stronger on all sides and move as fast as possible because we have to realize the challenges are phenomenal. I mean, the semiconductor industry has made a phenomenal progress over the last 50 years, but it's getting so much harder to continue that exponential growth in, in the future. Uh, and it's also, it's not only harder to just extend more slow, but it's also becoming so much more complex because we have all these different needs uh, from, from all the various industries. So we have to do this in the most efficient way and we have to avoid duplication uh, among the regions, among the, uh, among the continents. And, and that's what, why, why we are trying to kind of contribute in this uh, identifying the strengths and, and then linking all of that. And as you do that across these different emerging mm -hmm. regions, so let's say New York or the Midwest mm -hmm. or Texas Midwest or Arizona, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see a natural a university? Did you mention Purdue? Uh, do you mm -hmm. think a university is a natural partner, or could it just change depending on the? On the I think it could system? change, but of course, uh, the U.S. has some phenomenal universities uh, that that are doing a lot of fantastic work in this domain. Uh, uh, so I think we should leverage those strengths. Mm -hmm 
but at the same time, as we were discussing with New York, we, we are also ha having discussions there with Albany too, too. Because I think it's very important in the CHIPS Act, uh, if you want, I mean, speed is going to be very important. So existing infrastructure has to be leveraged to the maximum. And that's where New York, of course, comes in. Uh, and, and that's why I think making sure that the, the agendas uh, of, of New York and what we do and what the universities do, the regional centers do, we have to make sure that they are fully complementary and kind of bootstrap each other. Uh, Dorota, let me ask you on the workforce piece. So a couple of questions that, that we're thinking through here. One is from a, when you think about a workforce agenda, um, often the conversation with the industry tends to be some form of, yes, we have workforce needs, there are significant workforce gaps across the spectrum, and we are working with the following half a dozen universities and community colleges. That's usually the flavor of the conversations we have with industry. So the path to scaling some of those, you know, what works and figuring out how to scale is not always clear from a workforce development standpoint. In your capacity with the, with the Midwest Semiconductor Network, how are you thinking about scaling or finding the best programs and scaling them and also related to that, the workforce development agenda, to what extent do we think of that as a regional agenda versus a national agenda? That's an excellent question. So <clears throat> let, me, let me maybe build upon the few points that you made. Um, the importance of collaboration, the importance of bootstrapping, the importance of not repeating what's just you know, around the corner. So I think the whole motivation behind the micro, uh, Midwest Semiconductor Network was really, A, to understand that this is not just Ohio. Number two, it's not even the region that we have defined right now by these two, five states. It's in essentially a nationwide problem, right, that we are challenged, that we're trying to solve. And it's not going away in five years. If we are to reassure the semiconductor industry, we need to beef up our R&D to take over again U.S. leadership as we used to lead. Um, and then at the same time, of course, have the workforce for today and tomorrow. And that requires not just a simple pipeline, it requires a broader aspect of what skills are needed by industry and at what level. And it's not just semiconductor industry, it would be more. This would be also supply chain and it would be users, right? So we are thinking more, more globally, so to speak, in terms of the, um, who we need to train. So again, going to the pipeline, which is necessary, but it has to be coordinated. And this network is an attempt to coordinate, right? How, what do we teach and what skills have to be acquired at the community college level? Some of those students would continue to four-year college. We also need to understand that specific set of skills and qualities need to come from the work, workforce that would, would, be, uh, create, uh, would be educated by this, by this network. I also want to mention, <coughs> someone mentioned earlier standards, right? Standards of education as well. You cannot just have every different region or every different school teach something different, right? We need to understand what skill set is required and then uh, consequently um, implement this within the region and potentially elevate to national level by, uh, by the central organization um, such as NSTC. So there's a... So the standards point actually brings up you know, a, a conversation that we are now trying to have with the industry to say, look, you know, yes, we understand that there are needs. We also know that industries do their own, different companies do their own training. It would be useful for us to try to understand in the industry's experience what has worked, what is not working, what are the most efficient ways to train workers, what training programs yield the most productive workers. So you know, our hope certainly is that that information starts to become available. Even if it's not publicly available, it's at least available in some kind of aggregated fashion so we can identify the best programs out there and then figure out how to scale them. But you do see a difference between Ohio State going this alone versus Ohio State going as part of the Midwest Semiconductor Network. What's the difference? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Ohio State is as great as we are, right? We can't right now produce technicians, right? We are really, really good in, like I said earlier, Essentially, we cover the whole stack. We, go, we start from physics to materials through design and integration, right? And we are strengthening those uh, capabilities and, and grow the capacity now because, again, of the opportunity. But at the same time, we are thinking broader. We are thinking nationally. And this really has to do with um, working across 
not just R1 institutions, because we are always those big 900 pounds gorillas in the room. We need to enable, we need to work with um, institutions who actually have a tremendous value right now for the industry. And it's very important that we coordinate and we understand how the um, education flows. So by working together and listening to industry and working um, in, in sync, uh, I think we can be successful and we will be successful this way. Great. Phil, um, your comments about the states and the extent to which they've participated in the commerce RFL. I'm not going to comment on that. That information is publicly available, so folks can make their own judgments. Um, obviously, we have been talking to the states on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, and to the NGA and a bunch of those organizations. What advice, as you think about you know, the overall theme of today, um, the role that states and localities, either through the government or through regional consortia or universities, the role that they play, right, the important role that they need to be playing between the federal government and the industry. As you think about that role, what advice do you have for the Commerce Department in how we continue to engage that audience uh, because as I see it, you know, one hook that we have, and you mentioned it, is in the statute, where companies that come asking for incentives have to show that they have a state and local incentive. That's certainly one hook. And we can use that hook to kind of set a bar, hopefully, uh, of the kinds of incentives we want to see. And that's kind of what we tried to do with that first commerce paper that we issued, say, here's the types of incentives we want to see. What else could we be doing to encourage this sort of collaboration at the state and local level? Well, the, the, I think... And that, that's a really fundamental question because the, the relationship between the federal government and, and the states is structural. And, and underlying many of the ecosystem assets, such as universities, are really creatures of the state. They're sponsored by the states, the Ohio State University. They are funded by the states. They are land-grant institutions. Um, and, and certainly in my experience at the... Um, the federal level, states were always considered as, in a sense, a source of dumb money, right? You put out a program and you want the states to come to the table and um, uh, provide some matching funds so that you could leverage other people's money. I think the CHIPS program is different because of the history of the state engagement with the CHIPS industry. It's really been a bottoms up that the federal government, bottoms up approach that the federal government has now you know, wisely decided to um, build upon and leverage. Uh, if you're talking to the states on a regular basis, I think that's, that's, re that's really critical. I know when we tried to establish a manufacturing institute program, it was very hard to get, we were unable to get the states into the policy development process for both political reasons and, and other reasons. So if you are more successful in that, and this is, this is a dynamic process. Uh, you're going to face the problem, as you know, in the implementation of the facilities. Uh, it was mentioned by Bruce Andrews in terms of the application of federal um, environmental policy that, that, that layers, on, it layers on the state environmental policy regulations. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think there's a, there's a magic, you know, like a silver bullet, a magic wand. I think if you, and, and uh, I, I, I wasn't being critical, I was being, you know, provocative. I think if you're talking Factual. to, what, I th what's that? Factual. Let's Factual. Say. <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if you're talking to the states, I think that's, but you really need, I think the, the, uh, if you look at the attendance uh, online that, that, we, that was made available, I think there's still an absence of, of local government and lo state and local government participation in these discussions. And I think there needs to be a, 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 you know, a, a, an intentional effort to bring the states into the, into the dialogue as early as possible, which I know you're thinking about. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's driving us to engage with the states is not just the CHIPS program, but the fact that, you know, and this is not limited to innovation, it also, you know, the broader infrastructure and the energy infrastructure, all the other things that go into these big facilities, right? Uh, and there are federal programs through all of those, and for all of those programs, the state is really the convener of those different programs. So we'd love to see at the state level that coordination of federal dollars from different programs coming in to build out new energy infrastructure to you know, make the grids more reliable and more energy efficient to support the semiconductor fabs and make that a wider competitive advantage. Um, I recognize we're, we're 
out of time technically, but I do want to open it up one more time for the audience. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Tom Gavard, director of the IU Public Policy Institute. Uh, one of the things we heard earlier from our panelists this morning was the notion of inclusion in bringing participation and opportunity, really, to places that haven't ha always had that, whether they're urban or rural. Uh, but particularly as we think about university systems, state-sponsored collaboratives, uh, governmental collaboratives, or even not-for-profit. What can we do, what should we be doing uh, to bring greater opportunity to more people? Is that directed at any particular any, person? Any. Anybody want to take that? If I may just comment, because you touch upon an extremely important aspect, which essentially is also a fabric of MSN. As you, I, I will quickly show you the slide, but if you look at the composition of the organization that we have, we have large states, we have private organizations, four-year institutions, are two are ones we also have community colleges and HBCUs, so we actually are trying to bring everyone to the table. We are bringing the voices which probably wouldn't be at those opportunities that the network can create. Are we a finished product? No. But we are working really hard to make sure that we bring in the intellectual capacity across the board. And then we know that it's important for industry as well. And like I said and showed earlier, uh, we just established industry board and we're going to continue along those lines. I might add to that from a state perspective in New York, if you look at what New York has done for upstate, which was, uh, you know, part of the uh, textile industry, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, you know, the Erie Canal and all that brought to the region. Now it's really considered part of the Rust Belt. And, and so bringing a company like Micron uh, to Syracuse area is truly going to be a reinvigoration of that region. And, and that was not an overnight success. That was 20 years of planning and investment, not just by the state, but by the local economic development uh, groups, the counties and so forth, preparing shovel-ready sites for companies to come in and have the available water, electricity, workforce, and, and so forth. So it really, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It really takes some strategic investment to reinvigorate the, the region and prepare it for those companies to come in. And in, in the case of, of, of Upstate, having a focus industry that, the, that they're trying to attract, which creates high paying jobs over the long term. So I, I think it, it really takes uh, the, the local communities, the local community colleges, the university systems, and, and the state, and, and now with the you know, federal investment, it, it should accelerate that. And I can certainly tell you, I think, adding to that from the federal standpoint, from the CHIPS office standpoint, you know, there's many ways you can think about expanding the participation of in CHIPS to a wider network of underserved communities or unrepresented regions. One way is through the workforce pipeline, as Dorota was talking about. Another way is through the supply chain. And so, you know, yes, there are instances where the suppliers tend to locate in a cluster near the big facilities. But there are many instances where the suppliers don't do that. You have chemical suppliers on the Gulf Coast, right? You have material suppliers in the Northeast who are all looking to participate in the CHIPS program. So that's the other avenue of bringing in these regions. And then finally, I think the third one that we're looking at is from a construction standpoint. It would be, I think, silly on our part to expect that, you know, if you've got fabs being built out in Arizona, that all the workers for construction are coming from Arizona while there also demand for building EV facilities out there and a bunch of other battery facilities out there. And so we are looking at things like you know, prefab construction, for instance, as a way to say, can you build some of these things in other places and bring them there, or bring workers from other places there, because we know that you know, construction worker shortages is a serious problem that we have to deal with. And I believe that uh, actions on democratizing the access to this uh, capability, I think, is very important. Uh, I mean, your activities on design enablement, right. I think it's a similarity with what we have been doing in, in Europe, uh, uh, kind of make sure that any university basically can 
set up programs to kind of design chips in advanced technology, but that a university on, on its own can cannot can never get the access to to leading edge foundries. So so we, we built our programs which. Uh, uh, make it very cheap for university, but we also provide all the tools uh, and, and, and through cloud access, this can be made in a very, very uh, approachable way. Uh, and those are the programs that also, I think, lower the barriers, yeah. more democratize uh, access right. to, great, to this. From, from an outcome standpoint, it's a great point. In fact, the NSTC yeah. white paper that Eric talked about actually mm -hmm. does talk about the fact that one of the goals is to bring down the cost of sure. research and innovation mm -hmm. significantly, to exactly to do this to lower the barriers and get more participation. Yeah. So. Um, Tom, I think the, uh, as you know from your experience with EDA, I think the federal government has a particular responsibility and role and opportunity to um, engage uh, uh, Senator Young called it flyover states but underserved communities and, and populations. And uh, Secretary Castillo talked about capacity building. I mean, fr frankly, the, most of the local communities, the economic development organizations are overwhelmed by the variety of programs we heard about today, not to mention all the other ones. NSF has hubs, DOE has hubs, DOD has hubs, uh, the CHIPS program will have so, some sorts of hubs, uh, EDA has hubs. Um, and, and in order for traditionally underserved communities to participate in these programs, there needs to be an injection of upfront planning resources so that they have the capability to to respond to what are going to be very rigorous, rig rigorous requirements for participation in these programs. And that I think is something that I know Sri and his colleagues are thinking about. Richard journalist from Science Business. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Van den Hola. Uh, it, you talk about the importance of international collaboration. <clears throat> find it's a little difficult because of competitive fears. So is there anything specific that you think the US government or the European Commission or the G7 ought to be doing to make that kind of coordination and collaboration happen? Or is it just kind of a, a wish that it would happen? Oh, I, I I think it is uh, it is a necessity to make to make efficient programs, and and that's why at the level of European Commission and uh, U.S. government, uh, there should be serious uh, discussions, and I think TTC is one of the fora where this uh, this can happen to make sure that uh, the boundary conditions are set such that we can have very effective uh, cooperation and avoidance of duplication of initiatives, uh, because that would result in inefficiencies. Uh, the industry is strong is a strong uh, demanding force for that because the industry also works at the global level um, uh, the supply chains are global so I think it's very important that also on the R&D and innovation side we promote this efficiency in the system and I don't think I don't see fundamental barriers for that uh, and, and uh, I also see a strong willingness from in Europe and, and, and in all our discussions here to enable this as much as possible. Yeah, and I think certainly from a, from a federal government standpoint, yes, I mean, the TTC is one platform where mm -hmm. these issues are discussed. There are other discussions between the U.S. and EU governments, uh, also with the government of Japan, for instance, you know, there are discussions going on there as well, right, and also with the Koreans to try to figure out yeah. R&D collaboration. So, yes, I think there is a lot of that kind of contact. Um, it's still TBD and exactly, you know, do you need an official framework or an official agreement of some sort, or is it better just have government to government enabling of conversations throughout the, throughout the value chain? Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, Matt Preston with Deloitte, um, supporting the design of the NSTC. So my question is actually for all of you, uh, for your respective regional um, clusters that you've built, um, and especially, in, for example, the MSN, who is also in, in the sort of design phase. Um, <clears throat> how, uh, in, in the design of your various um, organizations, how have you been thinking about uh, collaborating outside of, you know, so for example, NY Creates working with IMAC or IMAC working with MSN, how do you, con are, are, and then and all the Manufacturing USA Institutes, like how do they, how do they, um, I guess, collaborate outside of their various spheres? I can start with that because, uh, you know, we have the AIM Photonics Manufacturing 
USA Institute. And it, it truly is a, a national collaboration. And there are some international participants in, in the manufacturing institutes as well. But uh, we coordinate with universities all the way from MIT to Santa Barbara and, and, and everywhere in between. And so it truly is an, a, a national collaboration for, for both companies as well as universities and other member organizations that are participating in that. I think uh, as we look forward in, in STC, Certainly, New York Creates is working with universities across countries. Our members, our, our, our industry partners are global uh, from, from all regions. We've had discussions with IMAC, Leti, uh, the Korean Institute of Advanced Technology, uh, the Japanese companies about collaborations there. So I think, you know, we, as moving forward, we really need to, we need to focus on cooperating across regions, not just across the nation, but internationally as well. Uh, we need to take most advantage of existing capabilities and, and drive those to get a quick start and, and uh, you know, engagement on the NSTC and not try to recreate duplicate capabilities. And I, and I think we have to be prepared to be engaged for the long haul, you know, from an investment standpoint, both from industry and, and government as well. If I, if I can add, uh, I think uh, it's a very important question, and, and I think it's, uh, it's something that deserves much more time and debate, uh, but I believe that cooperation is much more, should be much more than just talking together. Uh, it should be real collaboration, and, and with that we mean having locations where we put people together, where, where we mix teams, where, where we really work towards really joint research agendas, so it's, it's more than just talking. Uh, it is r forming real joint initiatives. And I think that's what should be the ambition when we say, well, we need true global collaboration. And, and we certainly have the ambition to enable that and, and, and are prepared to work together. That's what we are discussing with some of these initiatives. So uh, perhaps the last question. Uh, in putting these, uh, in putting together an NSTC, uh, leadership is going to be important. Since we have uh, some very experienced people on the panel, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that entails, and what uh, you know, what sort of uh, managerial acumen uh, and wisdom can you impart on any anyone who is um, fortunate enough to lead the future NSTC? Thank you. I'm definitely not going to be the first one to answer that one. <laughs> Luca, what do we start with you? <laughs> okay. I think the most important thing is to have a person with an open mind uh, and to, to, have, to have a person to, to kind of sponsor those collaborations, foster, enable those collaborations, because it is, I mean, it is impossible to have an, I think, it's not impossible, but I think it would be unwise to, have to set up NECC as one integrated activity at one location with a green field and start, start from scratch. That would be very inefficient. Mm -hmm. So I think, in essence, I mean, in practice, it's going to be a network with multiple, uh, m multiple people and, and teams involved. So I think a leadership that embraces that, that is open-minded, open collaboration, and, and is, does not have the attitude, oh, I know everything and I will do it my way or no way. I mean, that attitude, I think, is extremely important. Yeah, I, w I would agree completely with Luke. And you know, the, the person has to have a collaborative background and history has to have relationships across industry, academia, and even with governments, both locally and internationally. And, and you know, I think uh, has, has a, you know, it can't be strictly an academic focus or, or, or strictly a government focus. It really has to be focused on, you know, what's the long-term goal and where does the industry need to go? What resources need to be combined? Being able to have, uh, you know, some uh, ability to negotiate so that we don't duplicate resources and we bring people together to collaborate on driving next generation technologies. So it really is that kind of a, a person that's very open-minded and, and collaborative. 
If I may just add uh, one more comment to uh, what was just said, I think it has to be a person who understands we are playing a long game. This is, this is not five-year program. This is something which has to be sustainable, right? So all the components, uh, the characteristic we already named, I just want to add this. I, I, I have a personal opinion about this. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the Congress and, and, and NIST have clearly described the National Semiconductor Technology Center as a public-private partnership. So it pursues public goals with, with a private orientation, private managerial, but it's not, this is not a private sector corporation that will have everything within its four walls, which will be a top-down organization. The comments that the panel have just made about the perspective collaboration, engagement, with stakeholders with others. That, that reflects the public side of the, of, of the enterprise, and I think it's critical. And whoever she or he is who is selected to run the organization will have to assemble a team that reflects those capabilities and that perspective. Yeah, if I could maybe... So there is a tension between, you know, is it, is it an organization that pursues public goals with private partnership or private goals with public support? That's right. And Very there's good. always, you know, when you hear people describing what a public-private partnership is, there's, there's always a little bit of that nuance, right? And there is a tension there, and I'm glad you, you, you articulated the way you did. Um, and so you do, need, you do need somebody who knows how to bridge that tension. I think, and I, you know, it is, it is striking now that you ask the question. If you look back in history at these successful initiatives, you know, all the way going back to the Second World War, yes. how much of it is driven by the individuals, right? Like, who drives this thing? And sometimes it's serendipity. Um, and we would certainly hope that I think you know we, we find the right person. But it's a good question. That something I'm going to have to mull over for a bit as well. Chuck, last word. Certainly hope so, yes. That's why the board of trustees is really important. So everybody should send in their recommendations for who's <laughs> going to be on the, who's going to advise three on this, yes. and who's going to be appointed to the committee, yes, to the board of please. trustees. And on that note, uh, we will wrap up. Thank you very much you. to my colleagues for an excellent <laughs> panel discussion.
to moderate uh, today's final panel on the workforce. Uh, I think the case for a skilled workforce is an easy one to make. No workforce, no industry. Um, so, but the challenge actually is to grow a workforce in a policy environment where the prevailing incentives and needs don't always match. So I'm pleased to introduce four panelists today who are taking innovative efforts to unwind this particular knot and to align incentives and renew our workforce systems. Uh, so what we will do is we will uh, hear brief remarks from each, uh, and then we will sort of move to the chairs and have a question and answer uh, discussion for, for a period of time. So uh, first up, uh, Dr. Carter, uh, who I learned is a microbiologist by training, uh, directs uh, NSF's Advanced uh, Technological Education Program, ATE focuses on uh, the education of highly qualified science and engineering technicians for advanced technology fields that drive our nation's economy. Uh, the partnerships that ATE grantees build with industry, government agencies, and uh, between secondary schools, two-year uh, and four-year institutions position it at the forefront of industry needs. So uh, who better to get this thing started? Thank you. Well, thank you, Sujay, and it's a, pl a pleasure to be here. I wasn't too sure when I got here today. I, I said to Sujay, so did, is workforce at the end because you think everybody's going to be tired and they've already thought about it, or is it, is it, is it the, the sort of piece de resistance and everyone is going to want to wait and talk about workforce? So um, I'm not sure which, which one we got, but it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I did include my... Um, my email address there, because the first thing I'd like to say is take home. The take home of talking about ATE is that this is a program that's been around for 30 years now, working in partnership with industry, with community and technical colleges and four-year institutions, and please don't reinvent the wheel. Um, over, these, over these 30 years, uh, the ATE program has invested, or the federal government taxpayer funds have invested close to $2 billion in this program. Um, in partnership with industry, we have um, all kinds of skills and competencies that have been developed. People work with industry. They do DACOMs, developing curriculum. There are curricular materials around. And so this is one of those things to, to think about in terms of chips and science that there, there are existing resources, please don't reinvent the wheel, and please think about ATE, because it's really, I think, a critically important program at this point in time. And I know listening throughout the day, a lot of the terms and things that have, that have been presented by various panelists and moderators all resonate with the ATE program. So there's the take home. Let me, let me give you a little more information about it. Um, ATE is a workforce readiness program. It's looking at developing innovative strategies to educate and grow the skill technical workforce. So if you're, it, you may be familiar with middle skills jobs, blue collar STEM. I read a recent um, proposal, they're using no collar STEM. Um, Skill Technical Workforce came out in the National Academies study. That was uh, the title of that study is Building America's Skill Technical Workforce. It is that portion of the STEM workforce that does not need a baccalaureate degree. Okay, National Science Foundation, um, NCSES, the, the the center that collects statistics and publishes a a STEM labor report on a regular basis. It turns out that they had actually never collected any data on this sector of the workforce. And when Dr. Victor McCrary came on the National Science Board and the report from the National Academies was published, um, Dr. McCrary said, why haven't we been collecting data on this? What is the extent of the skill technical workforce? So it, the, in collecting the data, the STEM labor report showed that by looking at the skilled technical workforce across STEM, it doubled 
the, the actual workforce. So this is a program that has been around, it was actually 1992 when the Scientific and Advanced Technology Act um, was a passed and then signed into law. Um, so we're coming up, as I said, on 30 years because uh, signed into law in 92, 93 was kind of a planning year, 94 the program really rolled out. So, so what you can see here is skilled technical workforce, don't need a baccalaureate degree, two-year institutions, two-year community and technical colleges provide that innovative leadership in partnership with industry first and foremost, but certainly workforce investment boards, economic development agencies. I know somebody, I forget who said that, just somebody should be talking to the National Governors Association. They've actually done case studies on the ATE program and the success of the projects funded through ATE. Non-governmental organizations, all of those things form a partnership. But if you look at the bottom part of this pie chart, you also see high schools are mentioned. So in, in, the, in the law, it actually says that grades seven through 12 can be supported as well as four year. And I know people have mentioned, well, you know, a lot of these two year students, they're gonna go right into industry and they're gonna, they're gonna get a job. That's true, but some, and it's usually it's kind of a small percentage, but some percentage do get so excited, they say, oh, I'm gonna go on. I wasn't really thinking about transferring, but I'm gonna transfer now and finish a four year degree. So, so this, is, this is literally career pathways. Wasn't in the original um, language, but that's the way we would speak about it today. Uh, for NSF, for a workforce program, this is a fairly well-funded program. You can see the FY23 budget is 76 million. In the Science Act, ATE was reauthorized for the first time since 1992 with a potential authorization to double the budget. Um, I, I, in speaking with the um, staffers on the Hill, I said, please don't do that to me all at once because I have a hard time getting proposals coming in that would, could actually use that. So they, don't, they don't worry about that. That's appropriations and we'll make sure it kind of steps through it. So, so that's really what, um, what ATE is all about, workforce. And that's certainly something that's of great interest to the semiconductor industry. So I just, and this is going to be hard to read, but I wanted to say the take home here is ATE isn't just now moving into semiconductor manufacturing, nanotechnology, microelectrical me mechanical systems. These are some of the current active pro uh, uh, projects and centers, but they've been around for a long time. Um, probably the newest one is that one that's on top, the Micro and Nanotechnology Education Center, which is at Pasadena City College in California. Under that, though, we have the NAC Center. Penn State has been involved in ATE probably pretty close to 30 years. Um, and and they, they, they have developed everything from the RAIN network, re Remotely Accessible Instrumentation Network, to support rural and institutions that don't have a lot of accessibility coming into and being able to do work with various instruments and do research projects. Um, if you look down at the very um, bottom projects, they also came in and were awarded a Microelectronics and Nano Manufacturing Partnership for Veterans. So that's, that's an ongoing one. They did a pilot study. They've rolled it out on a net. They've scaled it up on a national scale now. So that's one that's ongoing. You have the ATE Regional Center for Semiconductor and Nanotech Education, Neotech. And I'm sure everybody goes, oh, SUNY Poly. We've, we've heard that name. Oh, New York Creates. We've heard that. Um, and, and that was actually how I was first introduced to Mike Russo, who will be our, our next uh, speaker, when he was at Global Foundries. Global Foundries, um, contracted with the Neotech Center to onboard all of their new, both technicians and engineers. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just the technical, entry-level technical workforce. And then we have the, the MEM Center, the Southwest Center for Microsystems Education. They still do a tremendous job of engaging students in undergraduate research projects every summer, bringing them into the clean room. They bring faculty in as well. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that, that ATE has been doing for a long time in partnership with industry. The curricular materials are there. The experience of these people is awesome. So that's, that's that take home again, please don't reinvent the wheel. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Mike talk about the development and implementation of a semiconductor workforce certificate program based on a unified advanced manufacturing competency model because that's, 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 his, that's his presentation. Whoops, let me. 
So I also wanted to mention that, you know, we've heard about partnerships today, and partnerships is something else that I think ATE um, thrives on. This one is, uh, is the Enhancing Engineering Technology and Advanced Semiconductor Manufacturing Technician Education. This is a partnership between NSF and Intel. Uh, Micron has a similar effort under, uh, that's, that's going on at this point in time, and um, ATE submissions are accepted that focus on semiconductor manufacturing technician education programs, and then Intel reviews them as well after they've gone through the merit review process. So, so that, that's one specific one that's pretty, that's pretty new. Um, other, other resources across NSF, there's actually a, a site on NSF.gov that talks about exactly what the Chips and Science Act did as far as structuring across NSF. You heard from Erwin Gianchandani this morning about the TIP, uh, new TIP directorate. Um, I, I just picked one bucket that's on that page, which was investing in STEM education. And ATE, the ATE program was called out, so was the CyberCore Scholarship for Service, since everybody now says to me, mm, information assurance and cybersecurity is actually an enabling technology across every advanced technology industry globally. And then also the Noise Teacher Scholarship Program, which is a, a program which there's a payback agreement. The people who are, receive those scholarships agree to work in a high need school two years for every year they've been supported as a, uh, uh, while, they're, while they're undergoing their, um, their teacher education. So, um, so that's, that, that's kind of a, a real quick um, walk through what, what is going on with the ATE program, and I think with that I'll stop and we can turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Celeste. I think uh, you're, you, you made the point about the change in nomenclature to skilled technical workforce. I remember I was directing the study Senator Bingham and others on the committee were very particular that the, uh, we get the, the, the terminology right because I think this segment of the workforce tends to be, uh, you know, the, sort of the Rodney Dangerfield of the workforce uh, segments. So they, they tend not to be uh, recognized for the value that they actually provide the economy and, uh, and industry. Uh, and, it's, and I think it's also interesting that you were mentioning the connection between uh, the work of uh, your program and uh, what Mike Russo uh, accomplished while he was in New York. Uh, so it's uh, my pleasure to now welcome Mike. Mike is the president and CEO of the National Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, competency, competency standards are used to ensure education and training programs align with industry job requirements and until recently no competency standards existed for the semiconductor industry. So Mike and his colleagues at NIIT developed the Semiconductor Competency Standard and uh, National Talent Hub to provide educators uh, across access, rather, to real-time information uh, regarding priorities from the U.S. semiconductor industry. Uh, so here's Mike to tell us more. Well, hello, everybody. It's nice to be last, right? I don't know. The, um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. And I, and, uh, I just want to really call out and, and really uh, augment what Celeste said before. I can tell you from coming from, from, uh, coming from industry, when you talk about skills-based learning, the work at ATE across the piece, and I think you had it in that four-quadrant uh, piece there, really, really speaks to it. Um, we, we really have to invest in skills-based learning from say K-12, but I guess you start early on in experiential learning, but uh, middle school, high school, community colleges, all the way up through uh, universities. If we're going to broaden the pipeline, we have to provide the ability for people to learn skills no matter where they learn them, how they acquire them, to really leverage them to support strategic tech-based industries. And that's really important when it comes to the semiconductor industry because uh, if you really think about it, it's a cyclical industry. And there's really that, not that many jobs, relatively speaking, in the industry. So in order to 
um, ensure that we have the right talent, you have to provide a vehicle for people to acquire skills and leverage them across all those strategic tech-based industries. And the ATE work is very, very important. Uh, I think uh, the issue about getting the money out the door is very important. What's, Celeste, what's Elaine's program? Is it a mentor program? She, she helps... Uh, Mentor Connect. I'm going to give a shout out for that program as well because there's a uh, Mentor Connect helps uh, colleges and universities understand how to access those funds. So you heard Celeste say there is funds and there's somebody there to help you understand how to get those funds. So um, if you look at the investments of uh, the Chips and Science Act, and really it's our first shot at that type of an industrial policy. Up until now, I, there was a few tools in the tool basket. Uh, you know, we had our manufacturing extension partnerships, some investments made in the, originally the NMI Institute's now Manufacturing USA. There's the uh, uh, work that's done uh, incrementally uh, throughout the, throughout the uh, government. We never had really a policy and, and really dedicated funding to support strategic industry sectors. So this is like the first time, the kind of coming out party, if you will. And, and really, I think it's very, very important for us to understand that it sounds like a lot of money, but whenever you dangle the, the golden carrot, everybody wants their hands on those dollars. Everybody has slick presentations. Everybody articulates the problems and everybody says they can fix it. Celeste hit on another point I'll just echo. Don't spend time and effort, energy and money on redeveloping what already exists, what the federal government has already invested, what's, are already, what's already proven, whether it's programs or infrastructure, et cetera. Play, pay to deploy, pay regions to take advantage of those and deploy. And I was very uh, happy to see the workforce uh, 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 program come out, uh, if you will, uh, the supplement to the CHIPS uh, RFP, where they actually called out resources for people to take advantage of. And really, hopefully in the evaluation, they're gonna really weight heavily the uh, collaborative efforts, those that take advantage of those uh, sources. So that's uh, really, really important. I think that, uh, one of the things that we bring to the table, and if you, it's aligned with the mission of the Institute, the is Institute uh, exists to monitor strategic industry sectors, those that are important to national security and global competitiveness, and make sure that they have what they need to continue to innovate, and if, the, if there's any risks, flag them, make sure somebody is working on them. When it comes to workforce, that's a major focus of ours because uh, that's one area that, that the nation has struggled for years. Um, we're focused on, that's a major, a major thrust of the Institute is to develop the national strategy, which actually we have developed, and infrastructure needed to create that national integrate, in, national approach and integrated infrastructure to build that pipeline. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. I will also say that that work, for anybody that says in a presentation that they're going to do it within a couple of years and have it implemented within five, I'm going to figure it all out. This work started back in 2010 at the request of then President Obama where he, he said with the proliferation of technology that uh, we were going to run out of talent and that there was no national strategy and we did not have uh, infrastructure in place. And he said at that time if we wanted to do something to help, that would be, where, that would be a good investment of time. And the reason why that conversation happened is because I, as a, 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 one of the leaders at the original uh, hires and leader at Global Foundries, one of my responsibilities was to make sure there was a talent pipeline to support a new semiconductor fab. And what we were doing is uh, learning as we go. And we found that different colleges, different nomenclature, right? You, nobody could go online and really figure out where they could go to get positioned. We had community colleges that were go off to Dresden, Germany and develop a semiconductor program, semiconductor specific, but doing it in, in a vacuum and, and, and then people that completed the program couldn't get a job at the semiconductor facility. So uh, uh, that's when we actually approached uh, Celeste, you referred to Neotech, that's where we said, you know what, this is a good partnership, let's, uh, let's see what we can uh, do with Neotech uh, and then maybe s develop something that's scalable there as well. The, uh, so we have at the Institute what's called our Center for Skills-Based Learning. That's where we bring experts from industry and academia together to, to kind of help determine how best to, ex now it's execute the strategy instead of develop, but the strategy, uh, it falls under what we call its uh, Talent um, uh, Pipeline Development Initiative. And so there's really three key uh, fundamental pillars. And one is the infrastructure required to connect and build the national talent pipeline, not workforce development, but talent pipeline. Two, 
the programs that are needed, best practices and programs to really engage K through 12 all the way up through post-secondary and adult and, uh, adult and veterans training. And then three, the ability to scale, how you scale. And so what we've done with the initiative really is, and we're in, in the process of executing as, as, uh, as we speak, we're really, because of the staff that we have, we're, we're really experts in semiconductor training, education, and implementation. And so uh, um, I, I really do think that we're the leader in that space uh, nationally. And what we're doing is we're, we call them opportunity hubs. So in order to scale, what we do is we go into regions around the country. We're in seven states now. We do full capability assessments. What programs exist? Is the curriculum aligned? Early on in K-12, do they have that experiential learning? Do they have the early college high school programs? CTE programs with the right curriculum? Do they have shared training assets? Do they have the right instructor base? Do they ever have the right tools and equipment that everyone can access? And on the curriculum side, when you look at the entire K-12 system, uh, you're talking about, you talk about diversity. You can go to NGOs all day long. You want to get to the diverse population of the country, go to public schools. They all go to school. And, and you can't start too early. And, and when you're talking 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they're going to be in the, they're going to be technicians in a few years, right? So. Um, that's the kind of the hub in, uh, model, if you will. And we've developed with actually the support, um, unsolicited support, I might add, of the National Science Foundation, the National Talent Hub. And the National Talent Hub is a state-of-the-art uh, portal. There's nothing like it existing today. And what it does is it, it's a dynamic system. We First thing we did is we went to, uh, we engaged industry representatives from all the subsectors. We took a look at all the existing competency models. We looked at what was relevant and what wasn't. We freshened them, if you will. Uh, and then we pulled that data into one database. We call it our Comprehensive Competency Standards Database. We then went and developed a semiconductor competency model. And it's not a spreadsheet that you hand to a university or a community college. It exists in, in this, uh, this uh, database. And what we do, I think that's me. Is that me? An alarm going off. Okay. Um, what we uh, what we're able to do within the uh, portal is uh, companies add profiles, not job descriptions, but they're very detailed, right down to the proficiency level. Uh, you know what what degree you need to know a, a certain knowledge, skill, and ability on what day, etc. And then what they do is once they establish that uh, profile. Every time there's an incremental change in a, in a job requirement, they just make that incremental change. And that system signals in, in real time, immediately, uh, the folks that are responsible for uh, courses and programs. And, and if they want to, it's, there's no certification. It's a business decision whether you adjust the curriculum. So if you're a state that's looking to attract a big semiconductor facility, you want to get ahead of it with a talent pipeline, you work that into your, your proposal. If you're a college or a university that wants to cater to a certain company, you can do that, or an industry, you can do that. It's designed uh, and based on uh, a unified competency model for advanced manufacturing. So if you know anything about competency models, the lower tiers are more general uh, requirements, and then you get up into more advanced manufacturing. So what we did is working with DOL, ETA, we took all the competency models and we pulled as much down as we could into the foundation of a unified model. And then what, now all we have to do is to use the talent hub for aerospace or pharmaceuticals or biomanufacturing or semiconductor. We only have to populate the upper tiers. And we do that through the same engagement process we use with the semiconductor industry. So the beauty of that is twofold. One, it's one portal, one infrastructure. It could be used across the entire country to support all states and place-based economic development. But more importantly, when you talk about skills-based learning, you're able to provide transferable skills, transparency across industries, so individuals that are able to, uh, whether, whether they pick up a skill through learning or through job experience, their personal profile reflects that, and throughout their lifetime, that updates. And so if there's a downturn in the semiconductor industry and they want to use those skills to go elsewhere, even without a credential or a certificate, because it's industry-driven, it's recognized by industry, the alignment's there, and, and they can move. So it's very, very important. Uh, and I will tell you that we're in seven states now with these opportunity hubs. We're going to have our first official launch, and that, that's because of the marketing involved, so, so people get excited about it, uh, the end of May. 
And what that will do is it's going to be an entire regional K through 12 system is going to be bolted and we're going to actually create the first formal true career and education pathway all the way up through secondary, uh, uh, secondary education. This is also important if you look at uh, enrollment numbers in community colleges and universities in traditional programs, it's, it's getting increasingly more difficult to pay the bills with tuitions, tuition. But if you go after, if you broaden the pipeline effectively, you get first generation folks, for example, taking advantage, getting their foot in the door, knowing they can succeed in a, in a high value job, a better paying job, their kids will be able to go to college and they will go to college as they want to climb that career, career ladder. So this, this graphic representation uh, really speaks to the uh, value of learn and earn models through apprenticeships. And what we've done is when we go into those and create those opportunity hubs, in essence, what we're creating is an apprenticeship pathway so much broader segment of the population can say, I want to take advantage of learn and earn. And we're opening the door through innovative programs so much greater numbers of people can take advantage of apprenticeships in, in the semiconductor industry and advanced manufacturing. And that also acts as a feeder for higher education. Uh, there's a link here to the talent hub, uh, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I don't need to go into it too, too deeply. I think uh, if you're interested, what we'll do is uh, we'll, uh, we'll loop you in. We could get you an account set up. We can give you a tour. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, we're, we're kind of fully leveraging the ATE network. I'm a huge fan of ATE. So for example, uh, uh, you mentioned Celeste, the Micro Nanotechnology Education Center. So that's a network of community colleges and universities that are focused on micro nano. They're on board right now. All their uh, colleges are establishing course profiles in the system. We're leveraging them for, we have the exclusive contract for uh, to uh, expand and establish apprenticeship programs uh, in semiconductor nanotechnology through DOL. So we're leveraging the talent hub. In essence, what we've created is an, is an apprenticeship database. So uh, in partnership with the community colleges, they are the RTI provider in all the hub regions. Um, so um, I think we're pretty much done here. Um, again, uh, I'm just excited that, that the discussion has evolved to, to where it is today. And together with the focus uh, that's been created by the CHIPS and uh, Science Act, it's, there's great opportunity, but we absolutely can get it wrong if we get really crazy with the dollars and, and shoot in different directions. Uh, the last thing that I will add is that there are two things I think that we can do is all work to create better alignment horizontal, horizontally uh, and vertically when it comes to uh, the government. You have states now that are funding uh, work that isn't really going to go anywhere, uh, that they are not tied to you know uh, assets and programs and, and existing capabilities, and you have the traditionally there's always been uh, different agencies throwing money in different direction. So what we really do, need to do is work collectively to send the signal to our federal agencies to work collaboratively, collectively, as well as state to federal government. And that's, that, by the way, is a, a, a topic of a whole other discussion is how to align state and federal government. But when you hold the purse strings, there's something you can do. But thanks very much. Sujay? Uh, Next speaker, uh, please to welcome Todd Yankin, who's the President and CEO of the Semiconductor Research Corporation. With more than 20 premier semiconductor companies as members, SRC partners with more than 100 universities and multiple government agencies. Uh, so since 1982, SRC has funded more than $2 billion in research, built a semiconductor workforce by sponsoring more than 12,000 graduate students, and provided over 700 patents to member companies. So, uh, Todd, if you would. Thank you very much uh, to Sujay and CSIS for having uh, us in here today to share our perspective. Uh, I am uh, Todd Yunkin, the, the president and CEO, only the third in SRC's history. SRC is not a household name, and honestly, this is a different circle than I normally run in. Normally, I'm hanging out with the ferroelectric gallium nitride, Algan, uh, scandium nitride group. Uh, so uh, bear with me a second. I think I have some points to share 
on the R&D pipeline and the workforce development. The first is I'm really honored to take the helm of SRC. It's a 41-year organization that really has a very simple concept at its heart, which is let's invest in the future by supporting ideas and supporting people. And, and I tell my team all the time, uh, when I say something, you won't hear me, but if Bob Noyce says it, says it clearly he knew what was, was going on. Now, he, he actually started SRC with a $500,000 personal check, which is amazing when you think about it. There's no way that would pass today. And so we have 41 years of proven results. We are a neutral, trusted, and science-driven endeavor. I read that somewhere recently. We have committed over two and a half billion dollars in R&D, and actually have over, I think, almost 16,000, where Lisa Sue, who thinks of herself as an MIT student, is actually our number one current SRC alum. So how do we work? What is the SRC model? I think that was part of the charter, and how can regions work with SRC? Um, the formula, again, is not difficult. We focus on taking ideas and either accelerating them into the commercial domain. Some of them go to IMEC. Some of them go to SUNY. Some of them go straight to the company. Some create startup companies. Some are proven to not be viable. Actually, those are more valuable than the things that graduate down the pipeline. Um, you don't hear about those, by the way. Um, we, we work currently with 28 companies and three government agencies where DARPA's MTO is our premium uh, partnership. Um, but we also work with NSF and NIST. Um, it typically takes one to two years to articulate what you're going to do as a subset of a bigger endeavor. Luke talked about the fact that NSTC, if it's one single kumbaya wrapper, it is destined to be in trouble. We have a, a wrapper that looks like a whole thing from the outside, but in fact, it's multiple components. So it takes one to two years to get people and dollars committed to an agenda. We have 95 million this year, which is not bad, figuring we were started in 1982 from a $500,000 check. So if self-sustaining is in vogue, we're self-sustaining. Um, we then commit to uh, schools, I say schools intentionally because I do have uh, community college students that are trying to get into Berkeley. I do have R1 institutions and everything in between. Um, but we commit to them on a three to five year time frame for ideas and people that meets the spirit of the program. And if you say, well, then you don't do anything longer than three to five years, that's not true. We have the Tex Ace. Uh, UT Dallas Analog Center of Excellence, now in its 12th year, which was a commitment to analog electronics at a time where everyone was saying that analog would die at the hands of digital. Uh, funny how that's now very important. Um, we have 3,000 scientists and engineers, and I say scientists and engineers because the semiconductor industry is importantly not just ECE people. So. All of y'all that are hearing from the ECE deans that they are the only ones that are part of semiconductors, I'm gonna show you that that's wrong in just a second. I'm a chemist. Um, I got a liberal arts and science degree. And those scientists and engineers, there's 2,000 that are academic faculty and students and 1,000 industry folks who have a day job and contribute extra credit hours to our success. One of the things I'm excited about with the CHIPS Act is I may be able to formalize some of the things that we do sort of as a side hustle that make us great. Um, and the way that you get industry dollars is you show them you have a goal and then you show them why you're either meeting or not meeting that goal. And so what we look to do is accelerate technology into the companies and the programs that are, are defined as a function of time and to get the students or the scholars as we call them because we view ourselves as lifelong scholars. Uh, it's a very fast paced moving uh, industry where if you don't reinvent yourself every year or two years, then you are no longer relevant. That's why I love it. Um, and in 2022, you can see that we uh, booked 197 meaningful technology transfers into our member companies and 209 uh, uh, 
full-time hires and internships. That's 45% of our scholar student population going into member companies. The actual rate of our students or scholars that go into the industry has been 85% for almost 20 years. And uh, uh, the, the basic gist of the member companies is do no harm. Uh, so we don't get too upset when Intel invests and then uh, um, uh, NVIDIA benefits. Um, so an important factor is to know what a semiconductor engineer is or isn't. And so this is data from our 2021 uh, scholar or student hiring profiles where they go off to, of course, Apple and Oracle and Microsoft, as well as uh, chip manufacturers, both IDM, foundries, uh, memory, et cetera. And when we take that and we, we compartmentalize that based on different subsectors, you can see that different groups have different needs. So the defense industry has a very high need for mechanical engineering and optical engineering and, and of course, electrical engineering but the, uh, the fabulous design community has different uh, needs where masters in ECE design is a much more uh, meaningful entry point uh, for the, the students or scholars moving in that direction. In general, uh, about 50% are uh, ECE, about 20% are materials, uh, about 10% are mechanical engineering and, and other forms of um, larger length scale engineering and then uh, about a handful, five to 10% are CS. And what our board has said, uh, and what they hired me against, um, is that we need 3x the investment in both technology and people at the ECE level, but we have to double the commitment to materials and mechanical engineering in order to have the process capabilities to meet the factories and the innovation needs of this $200 billion plus uh, build. So if you think of it, if you leave nothing more than 3x more ECE and 6x more materials and mechanical engineering and go tell a dean to care in mechanical engineering about something other than just aerospace and prosthetics and to care about uh, semiconductors, that would be nice. Um, so when I was hired, I basically said we have three pillars that I want to push for this decade because the last 40 years are already done. Thank you, Bob Noyce, Larry Sumney, Ken Hansen, and I need to protect the next 40 years through this roaring uh, 20s and hope that uh, 29 is not the same fate as uh, 1929. The first is a prosperity plan where we put out uh, as the first course of business the decadal plan for semiconductors, which was the what we need to build. That's the systems that the world needs for smart cars, smart cities, uh, 6G communications. We followed up with that on a NIST uh, roadmap for chips and, and packaging, which we call microelectronics and advanced packaging technology, or MAPT. Um, and that interim report has been put out, which includes a chapter, chapter number seven, on workforce development with knowledge, skills, assessments, and uh, the different degree requirements as a function of that lifelong learning pursuit. Um, the second is the people. We have lost the hearts and minds of young innovators. I was trained for the oil and gas industry and then went to nanotechnology. We can do that if we can convince folks there's a bright future and that there's uh, a narrative beyond the faster, cheaper, smaller, throw it away, but a need for them to help invent electronics, to make electronics that, uh, that honestly are, are uh, uh, the underlying uh, elements of innovation. Every dollar you put in chips is $19 in consumer-facing electronics where most consumers don't know what's in the box. It's magic. The the thing we need to do here is we need to find a way to normalize the participation so that ideas are coming from everywhere. This can't be an investment in women over here and an investment in a minority serving institution over there. We've got to make sure that they're all part of the community. And then we've got to find a way to ignite passion in this topic in US citizens. I agree with everything that was said this morning about our uh, uh, wanting to be a source of energy and talent from foreign students, they're great, but we need to find a way to get a balance of domestic and international involvement in this industry if we're gonna achieve what 9902 and 9906 are, are setting out to be. And I think the big thing there is that these, uh, these younger uh, next generation innovators and even uh, folks that are, are maybe retraining and want to commit themselves to a vector, they want to know that what they're doing is good for the planet. They want to they be involved in something that's making a difference. 
And so we have to be committed to sustainability. And that means energy efficient systems where Intel and Micron are saying that their inefficiencies are each other, right? Their parts are as optimized as they can make it be. And that's great, but we've got to get the academics involved in creating and solving solutions that are holistic, that are finding material alternatives that, that maybe even just uh, take away the NEPA concerns. Um, and this is really, for me, it's about winning the hearts and minds of the next innovator, getting away from that faster, cheaper, smaller uh, narrative that honestly took me into the industry and trying to find a way uh, to, to commit to their ideas for sustainability of electronics and electronic systems. So finally, you know, this is about regions. Um, we serve regions all the time. Uh, this is a great picture of our center of excellence on devices and materials out of Notre Dame. This is a great picture of me handing a, a check to Mitch Daniels at Purdue saying, you are the best packaging center that America has. And Mung was in the audience saying, let's put another zero or two on the end of that check. Yes, Mung. So let's do that. But here is also a map, a really nice map that SIA is putting out to help people understand where investments are. These are, uh, not all of these are SRC investments, but the vast majority of the dots there are SRC investments. One of the things we do in that three to five year time span is we oscillate between technical agendas and regions uh, in a very um, healthy way for, um, for our members, for the nation, and, and for the ecosystem. So we'd love to do more if called upon to, uh, to grow our ambitions and, 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 and our community. And if anyone has any questions, please do not be shy, as Celeste said. So we've saved the best for last. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Don Siegel, who is the the Foundation professor, professor and Co-Executive Director of the Global Center for Technology, transferred at Arizona State University. Uh, the semiconductor industry needs a skilled workforce, but this workforce needs to be properly managed and incentivized. So Don will tell us how improving work, workplace and managerial practices can accelerate the commercialization of research from universities and labs. And he'll also share his perspectives on achieving greater inclusion in the workforce, having uh, directed some of his attentions to bringing in uh, the tribal uh, groups and others also into the, into the uh, workforce. Don? Uh, thank you very much, Sujay, for that very generous introduction, which proves that not all forms of inflation are painful. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm from Brooklyn, so uh, subtlety is not a strong point. And uh, I have two very simple messages, one of which, by the way, was delivered this morning quite eloquently by Pre uh, President Halmeray you know, when he questioned the two senators. And my point is very simple, that in order to enhance the um, regional impact of the Chips and Science Act, which after all is the theme of our session today, we need two things. We need more effective tech transfer, which is what President Hamray was alluding to in his eloquent remarks and questions. And secondly, we need to involve, at least in my region, and I think in other regions in the country, we need to involve tribal communities in this endeavor, in technology-based economic development and in technology transfer. Uh, now, of course, I'm an academic, so my presentation is a bit more theoretical than the others. Uh, and I, even worse, I was trained as an academic economist. Uh, and that means, you know, how much economists love theory. R R Ronald Reagan once said that an academic economist is someone who, upon observing that something works in practice, wonders whether it works in theory. <laughs> so I have to give you a little bit of theory as well. But I also will do, again, what academics do best, engage in some shameless self-promotion. First, with the journal, uh, you may not be aware that there's an academic journal uh, which is dedicated to studying, uh, and it, well, it's dedicated to identifying and disseminating best practices in technology transfer, and truly understanding the managerial and public policy implications of this. 
So we've been reporting on this for many, many years. Uh, but I also want to put a plug in for our global center for technology transfer. And uh, I'm going to use an analogy here that many young people in the room won't be aware of. Uh, I I'm calling us the Wilburys of technology transfer in, in honor of the traveling Wilburys, if you remember that group from the late 1980s and early 90s. And uh, what we have amassed is uh, tremendous senior expertise on different dimensions of technology transfer. Studying this topic from many, many different uh, uh, disciplinary perspectives. And you may, uh, one name may leap out at you as one of the superstars that we just hired is Marianne Feldman, who is probably the, the world's leading expert on the impact of technology transfer on economic development and programs like the CHIPS and Science Act. Uh, so uh, now, how are we unique as a center? Uh, I think we're unique in four respects. The first, and this is really the most important thing, is that we study technology transfer at multiple levels. And this has not really been done before. And I say this as an economist because it's mainly been economists and sociologists who've dominated this literature studying technology transfer. So they study things like incentives and social networks, and those are all very important. But it's also important to draw on expertise in other fields, to study technology transfer at the individual level, at the organizational level, at the regional level, at, at the societal level, and at the national level, and that's what we do in this, uh, in this center. More importantly, we also study different institutions. We study firms, we study federal labs, we've had some major programs, because this is really one of the dark secrets of technology transfer. We know a lot about what's going on at universities, but we have no idea what's going on in these federal labs in terms of their technology transfer activities. Uh, and then, of course, we study multinational firms and startups. We have global partners around the world who are in, uh, experts on this. And then finally, we see a major void educationally in trying to understand and train experts in technology transfer. And this is broadly defined. This would include people who are involved in property-based institutions in technology transfer, like incubators, accelerators, science parks, technology parks, people who manage technology transfer at multiple institutions. And we're developing uh, programs for this and also trying desperately to get first generation, non you know, traditional students engaged in technology transfer as a field, as a profession, and as an activity. Here's an example. I mean, we heard President Hamray talk about how it's important to have effective technology transfer. Well, this is a program that we've designed which will allow uh, people to learn how to engage in all the activities that you need to engage in to be effective. Uh, and so we're, we're currently marketing this program and we're, initially we're delivering it within our own state uh, because our governor has taken the Chips and Science Act and decided to leverage that by, uh, you know, uh, launching a new economy initiative, uh, which has created science and technology centers, uh, one of which is in the semiconductor industry. Now, I have two recommendations, uh, and that is that accelerating commercialization of research, which is really what this is all about, uh, is going to require universities and federal labs to improve their technology transfer performance by achieving a better understanding of how to manage technology transfer in the workplace. Uh, that means a greater focus on the human dimension of technology transfer. Uh, we really haven't talked that much about this today. And, and so I'm going to be specific about what I mean when I say this. This is very important because I heard a vice president of research last week. We were on a call with the, um, you know, the NSF has developed the I-Corps hubs. And one of the um, 
uh, members of the hub was a vice president of research at a major university. And he said that 90% of the in inventions that they have commercialized were developed by less than 1% of the faculty. So technology transfer is not an activity that a lot of faculty are engaged in still. Even 30, well now it's uh, 40 years, uh, 42 uh, two years, 43 years after Baidol. So greater focus on the human dimension and accelerating um, commercialization of research, at least in my region, is going to depend on greater involvement with tribal communities, which have largely been ignored in technology-based economic development programs and technology transfer initiatives. Uh, we're gonna be announcing a major grant, which is a partnership with a tribal college to advance that goal. But what do I mean by these workplace organizational issues? Uh, well, uh, several years ago, I had the good fortune to co-chair a National Academies Committee on Advancing Commercialization of Digital Products from Federal Labs. And we did our, an extensive study, with, and this was not easy because the, data, the available data on technology transfer at Federal Labs is meager at best, particularly when you get down to the lab level. Um, and... Uh, the, um, can we go back? Oh, thank you. Yes, what we uh, recommended, one of our recommendations, I can talk to you about the other recommendations. We also, by the way, recommended much greater freedom on the part of scientists at federal labs to partner with industry and entrepreneurs. But one of our key recommendations was that we need a greater focus on workplace and human, the human side of technology transfer. Uh, that means, of course, looking at incentives, pecuniary and non-pecuniary incentives, how faculty and scientists are rewarded, but also looking at such things as organizational justice. Uh, we just published the first paper that's uh, ever been written on the role of organizational justice and workplace fairness and its relationship to technology transfer, which turns out to be very large. Third, the role of championing and leadership. How much do we know about who is championing and uh, inside the lab, who's championing technology transfer? And what is the role of leadership? Identity. We have programs such as NSF i which are asking, or really are designed, not only to give scientists greater knowledge of how industry and entrepreneurs think, but also to provide them with a stronger entrepreneurial identity. How, how well is that working? Then we have the thorny issue of work-life balance, which is a real challenge, especially for female scientists who have been really seriously impacted by the, by the lockdowns and uh, have had their whole world disrupted by that. And we're seeing a lot of disillusionment on the part of female scientists after all the progress that we've made in terms of uh, g getting women more engaged and minorities engaged in uh, STEM and in technology transfer. We also need a greater focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as I mentioned, that would include the tribal uh, communities and a greater understanding of how we can develop an organizational culture within these institutions to support technology transfer. Uh, so again, my message is very simple. We need more effective technology transfer to enhance the impact of the legislation, and we need to engage people who have not yet been engaged in technology transfer and technology-based economic development uh, into this activity. So thank you, Sujay, for inviting me.
First of all, thank you for your excellent presentations. I think you mentioned at the, uh, the outset, uh, Celeste, that uh, there was, uh, you weren't quite sure what the advantages of being in the final panel was. Well, there is some uh, wine and cheese, I think, afterwards. So that, uh, hopefully that tilts, that tilts the factor a little bit. So I, I do hope that those of you who have uh, stayed the course and, uh, and uh, hung out with us uh, till the end uh, do uh, get to participate in something nice. So, uh, but uh, you know, again, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, workforce challenge is something that uh, uh, is sort of pervades the discussions that we've had with a variety of stakeholders across industry, government, uh, as well as the academic academic side. Uh, I just want to tease out this workforce challenge a little bit. You know, what part of this is uh, this workforce challenge for renewing? our semiconductor industry is a high skill challenge, and what part of it is a skill technical challenge? Uh, are we looking at this in too integrated a way? Do we need to think about different solutions for both? Or do we need to think about a sort of a, a larger strategy that uh, encompasses both? Because right now, you know, immigration is a federal issue and workforce training is a state and local issue. And we've heard today that you know, immigration at a federal level is broken and that the state and local level uh, in, you know, uh, attention to workforce issues and other issues relating to uh, renewing the, uh, or building out the ecosystems for uh, you know, uh, knowledge-based economies, including, of course, semiconductor industry, there's intermittent engagement. Some states are doing it, other states and localities are doing it less. So how do, you, how do we unpack some of the incentives in the system? And how do we first think about it in terms of uh, you know, uh, high skill and skill technical? You know, uh, do, they, do each of these require a different, uh, different uh, you know, strategy of attack? take a stab at that. Um, high skills versus technical workforce. I think one of the things we want to focus on is lifelong learning for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think what that says then is that there is a um, probably a cross-disciplinary STEM core of abilities and knowledge mm -hmm. that you would want everyone to have. And that off of that cross-disciplinary core, I would say you want to support and incentivize students to be able to understand the different pathways that are available, each, I think each of which leads to um, advanced skills. And, and I think there's, there's, there really is not a, a, a huge barrier if a person persists in gaining those additional skills and having them recorded and acknowledged to moving within an organization. I know um, one of the companies I used to work with in the Bay Area had a biotechnology program there was Genencore. And they said, interestingly enough, um, their middle level managers all came from the, the core people that were running their, the, the, a, a very, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the best way to put it, a, a not highly technical area of the company. Um, and, and yet they found that that set of people had a set of skills and the ability to mm -hmm. move into mid-level management, and they found that they, they did that. Uh, it, it was definitely, it was running, really, it was running bioreactors. Mm -hmm. So it was, not, it was not something that took a huge amount of skill. Yet that was one pathway that they were taking advantage mm -hmm. of. And I, I think, for, for, I, th I would say for all the students, um, that's available as long as we give them the knowledge that that's something that's going to continue them moving forward. So in terms of this, the talent hub that you were talking about, Mike, you know, to what extent is there an, an information asymmetry between students and workers and what industry wants and what industry is communicating to the, com to the community colleges? Explain that triangle to me a little bit. Yeah, well, and, and I'll, I'll start by uh, I think terming it a little bit differently, mm -hmm. laying some groundwork, some, or a little different context. So until recently, um, advanced technology manufacturers, semiconductor industry really looked at a two-year degree as really the gateway to most mm -hmm. positions. And they also looked at hiring into the engineer level mm -hmm. directly at a four-year, you know, masters, mm -hmm. right, PhDs. And with the shortage of talent, and by the way, the educational institutions, as, as I think everybody knows, on the higher end, they, they're, they're the best in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really about engaging 
more individuals and, and providing uh, a greater degree of awareness mm -hmm. and then that connectivity. And the co connectivity goes three ways as you were referring to. So if we're able to uh, change the dynamic and it has been changing, uh, or the paradigm I should say, whereby the industry gives um, a shot to individuals that don't have the two-year degree. Mm -hmm. And if those individuals are provided the guidance necessary to know, are, 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 what our saying is mm -hmm. learn, earn, live, yes, you can. Don't count mm -hmm. yourself out, count yourself mm -hmm. in, right? If they are provided that pathway, beginning in public schools, mm -hmm. um, you, you will find that A, you get more talent in the pipeline, mm -hmm. and B, they will succeed, they're hungry. Mm -hmm. Don't ever count out a first-gen person, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a, a case in point. Um, I mentioned that we have the national contract, DOL contract, to expand apprenticeships in semiconductor na and nanotech industries. Uh, we have 37, it's, it's a new portfolio, mm -hmm. it's only a year old. Uh, we had to establish all the infrastructure. We have now 37 of the major companies are in. Mm -hmm. um, and we have uh, 60 community college programs in the hub. And now we're focusing on in, you know, getting individual awareness so individuals take mm -hmm. advantage of the tool. Just um, one month ago, one of the employers, semiconductor employer, major semiconductor employer, who had previously set the bar at two years, mm -hmm. uh, decided to give the apprenticeship uh, program a, a shot. Mm -hmm. Previously, it was not a consideration. One of the things that were attractive was, A, the talent hub supports it. Mm -hmm. B, mm -hmm. we, go, we also bring to bear the talent mm -hmm. pipeline development in the region to get more people mm -hmm. engaged. Um, and then also it's a scalable program. If they do it one state, we can take it and you don't have to recreate it, it goes in the next mm -hmm. state. So they said, okay, we'll try it. So normally it was in Texas. Normally they uh, would get 25 people to respond to mm -hmm. a posting. Uh, so they thought the number that would be challenging if they posted it as an apprenticeship mm -hmm. and the caliber of the, of the talent, talent coming in applying would be lower. They had over 300 people respond mm -hmm. and the quality of the talent was higher. Mm -hmm. They are in. So they're turning on in California, they're turning on in New York, and they're just mm -hmm. running with it. So that's an example of how you, you had asked the question based on what would be the systematic approach of uh, high end versus low end on the skills. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that employers have said, and I think you were referencing that, Celeste, is that they're finding that individuals that start and work their way up mm -hmm. make for better employees. Mm -hmm. They fit in with the culture, they mm -hmm. understand, they, they have real hands-on learning and experience. And as far as those managerial positions, they actually come up in a culture where people have to work much more closely to get mm -hmm. together. They might not have a degree in sociology mm -hmm. or psychology, mm -hmm. but they learn it on the street. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Um, so the you know the the other issue is uh, at the high, at the high end. I mean, are we uh, you know one part of it is immigration. The other part, as I think as you mentioned, was uh, you know get more American-born uh, individuals to uh, get trained. Uh, what how do we uh, you know given that we have uh, trying to ramp up uh, this industry and its scale. Over the over the uh, short term, what what are the how how do we weigh these two uh, options? Go ahead. You know, uh, I, I think it's impossible to answer that question that you posed unless you have more data on the demographics of the semiconductor workforce. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I haven't seen those. Yeah. I don't know. Well, partly the, where the, the workers are coming from. Partly and what the, the question is high end, uh, middle skill. We don't know. Correct. I mean, we we don't know what the need is. The needs are going forward. Right, but yeah. in that yeah. you come yeah. from nanotech, right? Global foundries. Where were your workers coming from? Where, where, where were they? Recent immigrants from Utica or well, someplace so, like that? Or for example, in the fab in New York, uh, because it was a new fab, right? Now it's a twenty billion dollar investment. Um, they to get the fab up and running, a great deal, a high percentage came from elsewhere, from abroad, because you had to seed right. the, you know, once it leveled out and, and uh, it broke down to about 50% of the workforce came from uh, the New York region and U.S. in general, and about half the workforce came from all over the world. There were 60 countries represented there. Okay. And the reason why it's important, especially in advanced technology, is because it, it goes beyond just filling the seats. 
you have to have the best and brightest because of the significance right. to national security and global competitiveness. Right. But that makes sense because New York politically is very open to immigration. It embraces mm -hmm. immigration relative to other states. And one thing I also noticed that the nano people did, which I thought was very smart, is that they were in the high schools in the region. They were very active. I think they even had a high school. They ran a high school. Actually, well, it helped, right? it, it helped I mean, establish a, a high school focused in that. But yeah, that that yeah. strategy we developed that strategy That's with the regional good stakeholders, strategy. Yeah. and and it really does take that. That goes back to what I was mentioning earlier mm -hmm. that you have to really build a pipeline. Yeah, yeah I've seen um, a variety of folks trying to uh, dissect um, the numbers. Uh, uh, that we're at today with the status quo, where we need to go uh, with the semiconductor industry, quoting that there's $200 billion in projects that have been uh, sort of slated uh, since the NDAA uh, uh -huh. was authorized. Um, you know, at a very high level, uh, I think we need 3x the intensity in both the technology and the people and that uh, we should all be considering this industry to be a lifelong learning and higher uh, educational attainment uh, driver. Um, the numbers I've seen uh, that are really important to understand is that at lower levels of educational attainment, people don't move as far. So if you're going to be targeting uh, high school AA technicians, you should be doing that regionally to wherever you anticipate employing them. Um, as you get to higher levels of educational attainment, they tend to seek careers that are the best fit for their career trajectory and they're willing to move much further distances. Those graduate studies in the, again, the, the ECE is a driver, but there's other degrees that are important to make up semiconductor industries in the different subsectors. Mm -hmm. Uh, approximately two-thirds of them in the United States are currently foreign-born. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been basically the same since about 2005. Mm -hmm. So if we want to find balance, we need to find mechanisms and find agreement that we will fund mm -hmm. domestic students. And I would argue that I have plenty of applications that we can fund mm -hmm. if the nation wants to move in that direction. I fund 5% of the ideas I get and most of the talented young innovators go into bio and batteries because they don't find support and, and attention in semiconductors. And hopefully the CHIPS Act is changing that. Mm -hmm. Are there questions in the audience that... Uh... On August 9th, when the CHIPS Act was passed, I wrote a letter to Gina saying that I could take $300 million that day to expand that network I showed you. Hmm. Well, I think almost everyone could take $300 million. No, but I mean, to, we had the proposals in hand. They had already been ranked. There was a network there. There was a, a DARPA investment with industry for $331 million that will run from January 1st of this year to December of 2027 and is honestly the flagship research investment that America has, my, my proposal to her was that we just double that with commerce injection and commerce mission aligned uh, to, to the defense mission that MTO was, was bringing to bear on that uh, edge intelligence program. So we can absorb, but um, I don't know if she's read the letter yet. So. <laughs> I've talked to Sri a few times. He's, uh, he's busy with 9902, so. Well, I think it's a powerful argument. I hope you would um, push we, that. Because we keep one trying. Of, one, of the, one of the challenges in implementing the CHIPS Act is the tendency to want to run around and dig new holes and start new, new institutions, uh, partly what yep. Mike was addressing. Okay. And, the, and I, I've been a long time admirer of S SRC, uh, and using that base to to rapidly scale would be <clears throat> but it does draw if I'm not mistaken on the engineers who are submitting proposals are already engineers um, not entirely maybe that's uh, something that we have to do a better job of is educating people as to how we're different than SRC 1982 or SRC 2000 
Um, and the ironic thing, of course, is that in 1982, if you look at the first Dane report, it was gallium nitride photonics uh, design and uh, accelerate innovation and workforce for semiconductor relevant topics. So, you know, the pendulum has swung back in a very uh, a shared, importance, collaborative type way. But ultimately, um, what our companies and prospective companies uh, say is that this isn't a workforce challenge, this is a workforce crisis. And if we develop the technology and neglect the human, uh, we will not accomplish the CHIPS Act. So SRC is here to serve in any way, shape, or form that it can. I probably can't accommodate more than 3x growth for the time slice and the, the technology objectives I'm trying to do. So what we're trying to do is also feed the NSTC and the NAPM piece future uh, today mm -hmm. so that uh, we can make sure they're successful down the road while they uh, attend to uh, near-term objectives. Are there other questions? Tom? So, Mike, uh, you mentioned something that I thought was very interesting and important, and, I, and, and Don, I think you chimed in on this, but I think any one of you could certainly answer this. It, it sounds to me like the apprenticeship program, it's really about interest and aptitude. Come to our company, we can put you in a program, teach you what you need to know, and you can advance from there. But it also sounds like it's geared, which is important, uh, i stipulate that, uh, that it's geared toward younger people, toward the high school. What about people who are chronically unemployed? What about, for example, Don, you re referenced working with tribes. Has a, has a very, how do, we, how do we actually do the outreach there and get them interested? And, and equally as important, how do we get firms to buy, more firms to buy into that approach? Yeah, I can, uh, first of all, it's not just for youth. It's uh, absolutely mature workers and those that have, uh, for whatever reason, not been engaged. In fact, this provides a pathway to re-engage or to engage for the first time even as an, uh, an adult. Um, so, and, and what we've done with our in more innovative approach to apprenticeships is tailor make it to not only the industry, but those individuals. When it comes to the Native American population, uh, we've actually begun outreach to do a wholesale uh, investment with the tribal communities where, mm -hmm. uh, where they are in, and they are in, in, in three in particular regions where are big semiconductor regions. It absolutely makes sense to, to uh, provide those folks with not only the opportunity to learn and earn, but there's also an opportunity to build some training facilities mm -hmm. that absolutely would, would cater to them. I don't want to say more, any more on that. So we're working on that as part of a national strategy, something that would be uh, a national approach. Uh, the other thing that we've done is we've worked with DOL to, uh, even as a 501c3 that works for the government, government contracts and grants, right? Government contractor. You can't go on to bases and present. You can go to job fairs, right? But, mm -hmm. but the agencies brief returning members and families uh, on, on what's at their disposal. Um, and so we said, you know, they, they should all, free of charge, be able to establish profiles in the talent hub and leverage it to raise their hand and go into the apprenticeship database or get matched with careers, et cetera. Uh, we had originally started down the MOS path, and then because the service branches are different, we actually created in the system. The system now translates all that automatically into industry speak. And so uh, they thought that was a good idea. Now through the Veterans Employment and Training Service, just recently they uh, ac accepted uh, our application into that and that's gonna be made available to all returning service members. That's a very diverse population. So though, I mean, I could go on, but those are two populations that we're directly interfacing with as part of a national strategy and approach, not just incremental numbers through an NGO, but directly with the population uh, to, to pull them in. And the tools we've designed are for that purpose, not just for, not just for the you know, K-12 students. And I could add something there too. I would really push thinking outside the box, wondering about who's competing with who, and actually collaborating and working together. One of the endeavors um, that is ongoing currently, and we just got a new Dear Colleague letter published, is a partnership between the ATE program and the Industry University Cooperative Research Centers, mm -hmm. which partner with industry, right? And, and R1 universities or universities. And, um, and also the engineering research centers. And the point of this is that th those two entities in the engineering programs can reach out to any community college anywhere in the United States and request supplemental funds to support 
both faculty and two-year students coming and doing research projects at their <laughs> sites or at their member industry sites. And any ATE awardee can work with either of those two programs as well to bring faculty and students in. We added even developing teams of two and four year students so that they work together collaboratively. And, and I think that's one of those things we're seeing some really, really tremendous results coming out of collaborating across programs and working together, thinking outside of what we normally would do. And, uh, and, and I, think, I think that's another point to make is, is that, is that um, working in our silos only takes us so far. We need to think outside the box and come up with strategies that are going to widen and broaden the number of people coming into these industries. And certainly community and technical colleges, 30% of the students on those campuses are first generation students. More than 25% are Hispanic and Latino students. Uh, you've got a, percent, a large percentage, of, obviously there's more women than men now. I'm thinking about some of, the, some of our, our, our advanced technology industries. Um, you've got um, Pacific Islanders, you've got um, black uh, or, his, or African American students. So when you talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a tremendous population to do an outreach to and to bring them in. Um, you do just have to have the um, support structure. I know one of the um, IUCRC sites is in Arizona and is yeah. working with students. And one of the things they asked me was, can we have a, a tribal representative to support yeah. the 10 students that are gonna do their internships this summer mm -hmm. so that, that that older adult can then support the students for any questions and concerns mm -hmm. that they may have? And I said, absolutely, do it, you know, mm -hmm. put it in there. Actually, that's a really great point that we have found as a key for success with mentoring um, uh, non-advanced degree students is really making sure they have a sense of a cohort, they have some on-site uh, uh, leadership or, or help uh, support. You know, a lot of the R1 institutions that you would naturally think of have all of that and support their students, but if we want to expand that outreach and catch um, uh, ideas from everywhere and everyone, we have to make sure that we bake the support into the engagement model because ultimately they need the time, they need the help, support, the ideas, the connection, not just a check. So uh, if I can reserve the, maybe the last question. Um, you know, we, uh, we've been talking a lot about, well, the whole issue of technology transfer was essentially born some, you know, in the, in the 80s with, uh, you know, landmark legislation by Dole among them. Uh, that conversation has lasted now for the past 40 years. We're talking about different things today. So how is the, you know, as a, as a discipline, uh, or as a journal, uh, is that being reflected in what you're seeing in terms of uh, what, what the journal is attracting or, or what, the kind of, what kind of questions the, uh, well, are being posed uh, in academia? Again, I will not yeah. be subtle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a mission from God for two, two things. One is to shift the focus away exclusively in the academic literature, away from universities, and more towards the federal labs. I feel very passionately that the federal labs are a critical aspect of our national innovation system. They receive more federal funding for R&D than universities do. Uh, the, let, let me give you an example, and this always shocks people. The, the federal labs in California employ more scientists and engineers than all 10 UC campuses. And they spend more money on R&D than all 10 UC campuses. So that's one. The second is this focus on the human dimension, mm -hmm. is that we need greater attention. Academics have literally ignored important topics on the subject of technology transfer, they've ignored topics that are highly relevant in management and mm -hmm. in organizations mm -hmm. uh, because they don't study the individual scientist as much as they study the organization and the mm -hmm. institution. They don't mm -hmm. study the issues I mentioned, mm -hmm. like championing, mm -hmm. like work-life balance, mm -hmm. like uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. and so on. 
uh, and identity, and you could go on and on and on, and organizational justice. So, so that's what we've been trying to promote, and I've been out in the journals trying to uh, mm -hmm. encourage more and more academics to publish more papers on the federal labs, mm -hmm. get inside the federal labs, and also to explore that human dimension. And uh, so, I, uh, well, one, one more question. So from <laughs> perspective of SRC or NSF, has there been any attempt to sort of reframe the questions that uh, you've been asking in terms of uh, workforce issues? Um, I will be on a call with the National Labs tomorrow talking mm -hmm. about the ATE program and, mm -hmm. and opportunities to, uh, to partner and support. Uh, another one of the Dear Colleague letters that is active within the ATE program is on undergraduate research mm -hmm. experiences. And, um, and this is actually facilitated by someone from Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, w I, w I really want the federal labs to hear that there's funding for this. Mm -hmm. Um, they, do ha they do have programs. They used to have the FAST program, which was faculty and student teams coming. They do have a community college student program. Um, but again, it's getting the word out and, and, and getting students to the point where they feel comfortable. You know, um, we, I had Del Mar College in, in Texas. One of the faculty always used to travel with the students to, to Lawrence Berkeley Lab every summer. Because for a lot of the students, it was the first time they'd ever been on an airplane. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that type of support needs to be there as well. But um, I, I, I guess I can follow up and let you know what happens. Well, in terms of, you know, reaching out to the federal labs, you know, CSIS uh, can serve as a platform. You know, we have a lot of, CSIS is primarily a national security think tank. And I think uh, coming, in, coming from us, uh, some of the encouragement that we can provide, I think, would be helpful. Uh, you know, I think one very promising development is that Autumn and the FLC, the Federal Lab Consortium for Tech Transfer, which is the association of tech transfer people at the Federal Labs, they've merged. Mm -hmm. Paul Zielinski has taken it over, mm -hmm. and there's a lot more cooperation now between mm -hmm. the two organizations. And I think the universities have become very mature in, and manage tech transfer mm -hmm. fairly well now. They're getting a little better and more engaged with the entrepreneurial community. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of uh, mm -hmm. those best practices will be shifted, hopefully, to the federal level. Well, there's so much to talk about, but so little time. But I think we are indeed out of time. And uh, so uh, in just in concluding, I just want to, first of all, thank uh, Tom and uh, IU uh, for their partnership in organizing this event. Uh, I want to thank my staff. Uh, particularly Greg, uh, uh, Greg is over there, uh, Alex is over there, uh, Shristi is over, over there, yeah, and, uh, and Hideki over there, and Chris may be somewhere here as well. So thank you to all of them. Uh, you know, we're talking about how uh, uh, it takes uh, a quite a, a huge team, so there's uh, the CSIS staff, including the folks behind the screen there who have been live streaming this event uh, so professionally. Uh, there's also the congressional outreach staff who were uh, very helpful in getting uh, the participation of our two senators this morning. Uh, and you know, the, the catering staff and security and there's a lot of work that goes into putting uh, an event like this together. And uh, finally, I, I just want to reach out and thank uh, a series of senior advisors to our program here. Uh, particularly to Chuck Wessner. Uh, Tom is also a senior advisor. Uh, Phil, are you still here? Oh, there you are. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, uh, and others who, uh, who regularly contribute, including you, Mike, to our, to our program. So thank you to, to all of you, and uh, we can continue the conversation perhaps over a drink. Thank you so much. <laughs>